good, everybody. This is Nathan Albach, and welcome to the podcast where we get into people's stories and go down a bunch of rabbit holes about what's really good in the world. <laughs> For today's episode, I had the pleasure of sitting down with my friend Kenneth Worstall, aka Home Chef Kenneth. Uh, K- Kenneth is he's a hometown icon, really. <laughs> <laughs> known to many for his mushroom foraging and hunting and a, a love for dancing and storytelling and really anything, now that I think about it, anything that involves like living off the land or various eccentric hobbies. I mean, he's a great guy. Uh, we've hung out more times than I can count over the years. Uh, we have lots of different friends groups and he hangs out with my family, which is really cool. Um, but this is the first time we actually ever sat down one-on-one to talk, long form at least, and it was a cool time. Um, We got pretty deep into his upbringing, especially in the beginning of the podcast, just how he initially got into cooking, then becoming an actual home chef, and then we we talked a bit about the tragic passing of his dad and the impact that's had on him throughout his life and how, like, spirituality and and personal identity and, and mental health issues really became weaved in with all that. And I mean, we, we also touched on like hunting and social media and, and shared a bunch of like just fun, interesting stories. So yeah, I mean, like before we started this whole thing, it was funny, like we were talking and uh, kind of let me know, he let me know that he's actually never listened to a podcast before. And, and obviously this is his first time being recorded on one. So yeah, super funny. Um, he's a great guy, like I said, and I really think you'll enjoy the conversation. Now let's get into what's really good. Kenneth, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks, brother. <laughs> Your first time, man. Yeah. Just talking about it. You don't even listen to podcasts. I have no idea what it even is. <laughs> <laughs> You're the perfect podcast uh, prototype, then. You can, you, can, you can be our experiment. Amen. Right? <laughs> so, man, I mean, we've, like, I mean, we've known each other for a few years now, I believe, but I don't think we've had a strictly one-on-one conversation have we? No. Like this. It's always around friends, family. So Yeah. So it'll be cool. I wanna I wanna get to know you a little better and uh dig into some some good stories, right? Amen. So, yeah. so I mean just uh I mean for my own sake and for anybody listening, uh where where did you grow up? I uh grew up in North Wales, uh born and raised, uh Chestnut Hill Hospital. Um, right there near Narstown pretty much. And did you grow up up here? Do you 'cause you lived down south for a while, didn't you? No, my my family's from Mississippi. Okay. So I have a lot of roots there. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a lot of relatives down there in the southern tip of Mississippi. Um, I had a girlfriend down there. Okay. Um, but never uh, never actually lived there for an extended period of time. Because you have a very strong cultural tie to the South, I like to say. Like, you have a lot of um, funny language reference points and... And just a general, like a general feel, the uh, like that southern hospitality type vibe. Did you pick that up from family? You think, or from traveling? I think so. Um, I think my main source of that hospitality was my mom, my grandmother, and my grandfather. Mm. Um, they were born down there and um, came up here um, with an awesome opportunity. Um, with the Eagles. Mm. Uh, my grandfather played for the Eagles, as we've talked about yeah. before. Um, and he grew up in a, a small shack in Mississippi. Wow. And he wanted to he wanted to do better. And when he was able to come up here with the Eagles, that was kind of his uh, I made it type moment. Right. How did that opportunity arise? Um, he, so... There's kind of a backstory with everything in my life. Um, he he was 
at a paper mill working um, young. I think he was – some of the ages might be a little off, so I'll just kind of ask the Of mate. course, so, yeah. Memory is fickle. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he was like uh, 15 or 16, and he would help his father with this paper mill. So it was right on the water. They would uh, send logs down the river, and one day he was uh, – lifting these heavy chain blocks. It was like a 1,000 pounds, and he was just pulling these chains six foot eight or six foot whatever, six, six, Mm -hmm. whatever, just 200. He was real small at the time. He was very thin. Um, But a coach, I guess, from what I understand, came by and uh, said, you know, you should be on the football team. And um, that sort of turned into high school football, then it turned into Old Miss, and then it turned into the Eagles. Um, he was uh, the center for the Philadelphia Eagles. It's so wild, man. In the 50s, um, early 50s, BBM, uh, before big money era. Right. You got, so, you got any, like, good stories from him of that time? Like, did you grow up with, like, with your grandfather? Or, like, how well do you know him? Yeah, I mean, I knew him until, like, five years ago. Okay. Um, I remember he would tell stories about, you know, how players now are pussies because they don't have, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> they don't have, uh, they have too many pads on, he would say. Oh, wow, okay. And Did they play with helmets back then? Yeah, it wasn't much of a helmet. But yeah, right. It was like a leather piece with right, a face right. guard. Yeah. And so he would just tell me, like, he had these uh, forearms, and he said that was the best weapon down the field. Mm-hmm. And uh, he broke jaws and broke necks. And, Jeez. You know, his uh, best friend was, uh, his name was K.O. Dotley. He broke both of his ankles. And instead of getting all carted off the field, they just shot you up with Novocaine. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, he was a beast, you know? Uh, d- different time, man. Could you imagine if it was like that now? I mean, I guess it's it's more similar to rugby oh, in some way. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely lot... crazy. Yeah. I mean, he would, he would uh, laugh because people are getting penalties for touching someone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he be like he made uh he made like four thousand a year. Wow. In that era. And uh he got another five hundred for his uh Pro Bowl. And that translates pretty well for that time period, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, like I'm trying I I don't know how to do the math off the top of my head, but it wasn't enough to make a living. Oh, okay. Um so my grandmother would sell uh, pimento and cheese sandwiches. Wow! For like a nickel a piece to kind of supplement the income a little bit. Mm-hmm. So she did great too. Yeah. So it was kind of like a husband wife team type yeah. thing. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. Yeah. So then they ended up here, and then he would always talk about how he had different mentors to uh, help him along. Mm-hmm. Um, Amby Callen, this guy, Coach Swayze, one of his coaches. And uh, he eventually opened up a a roofing company called United States Roofing Company. Wow. And it's one of the biggest ones out there now. No way. Yeah, they're doing a lot of states, different states. They're all commercial work. And uh, that was his kind of legacy. He just, he named it United States Roofing Company because it sounded so big. Right, of course. And he just loved that name. Um, he would say, you know, surround yourself with people that are better than you. Mm. And that was like his business success yeah. motto type right. thing. I love that, man. Like that's been a huge, uh, I guess, similar motto for me with, with even this podcast. I mean, I like to think if I'm going to be learning from people, if I'm going to have conversations with people, like I almost, I want to punch up. You know what I mean? Like, I want to have people that I, I think are smarter than me, more talented than me, yeah. you know, are just bigger and better than me in a lot of ways. I mean, obviously, it's, it's completely arbitrary to, to an extent, but I, I like the thought, the idea of that, because, you know, we are who we surround ourselves with to a degree. And I think, you know, obviously, life is a is a spectrum and there's there's people lower than us and above us and are right next to us and and all that. But I think it's so important to have that, like, just keep that in the back of your mind, you know what I mean? Because, like, the people that are above us, they're going to bring us to that level. So, man, you know, it's good. Yeah. It's cool that he passed that on. Was was the business itself, was it a family business, or did he sell it, or what happened with it? It was a family business. Um, my uncle kind of took it over 
And my grandfather had established it pretty well. And then my uncle David, he took it to the next level, I would say. Mm. And there were a few family members involved. And um, now to this day, more of David's family is right. involved. So kind of like your still, cousins. And, yeah, 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 yeah. It's still a very positive, uh, positive business. Cool. So, and I just never got involved. I don't know why. Hey, well, you, you had your it's own just path. Fate. Yeah. You had to become home chef. Yes, home, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Well, let's yeah. jump into that. I mean, that's yes. like obviously I want to like locally known. I mean, I, we joke about it. I mean, obviously, like when you've come to parties or various gatherings where mutual friends of ours are, maybe new friends, um, you've been known as home chef to many people. So what a... Yes. What initially got you into wanting to be a a chef or a cook? Yeah, so when I was very young, um, I would watch my grandmother, my grandfather's wife from Mississippi. Her name's Jane. Um, My Momo, I would call her Momo. Momo. Love that. Yeah. So um, I would watch her make gumbo. Like she was the best cook I've had to this day. Mm, Wow. So she was, I mean, one of the earliest memories I have of her is calves, liver, and onions. Like, totally awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah. And I would watch her make these things. Um, gumbo being the first thing that I really, like, you know when you watch an artist, you're watching them paint or someone play an instrument that's, like, so good at it? yeah. And you get this feeling over your body that's like, I don't, I don't You're know. You're mesmerized. Yeah, mesmerized. Yeah. 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 So I watched her do this. I watched her peel the crabs. I watched her peel the shrimp. I watched her make the roux. The brown roux is like everything. Mm-hmm. I watched her cut the trinity. I watched her throw filet in there. Um, and I was completely awestruck, like... I love the look of it. I loved how the th- everything smelled, obviously. Mm-hmm. I loved eating it. Um, and I always had that. I wanted, I, one day I just asked her, I said, Moa, can I help you? And she said, sure, mm-hmm. sure. And one thing led to another. I was helping her make it. Yeah. Was cooking like a, like with your family, was it a... I don't know how to word this. Was it an instrumental thing to how, like, the kind of family dynamic worked? Like, was it something that everybody kind of pitched in, or was it more just, like, Momo did it? Was it, like, I you would, know what I mean? I would say the whole uh, eating would be the family part. Mm-hmm. But just the cooking was more just her. More her okay. because she was she was Southern. I mean, she, was, she had a lot of brothers and sisters. I think she felt like the mother... Right. Her yeah. mother was a realtor in uh, Mississippi, so she was working. And I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, she did a lot of the cooking mm-hmm. and learned that way. And, you know, she was – so she taught me how to cook gumbo. Then she taught me how to cook eggs. And then the biggest, biggest thing she taught me how to do, one, is cook from the heart. That is, that's an amazing gift. Mm. You can either do that or you're looking at recipes and attempting to cook. Right. So, and once you're able to look at recipes, she taught me how to look at multiple recipes and then make, take what you like about that recipe and then add it to this recipe. Yeah. And then eventually it becomes a melting pot of all the things that are inherently good about those recipes. Right. And then it becomes your own. Yeah. So, you, yeah, that's that's the making of a great chef, just yes. using recipes as a springboard, really. Yes. That's when, I, that's when I noticed growing up that was when my dad made the the kind of shift. I mean, obviously, I know you're really close with my dad just as a 
as a kind of home chef himself, you know, he fell in love with the art in a similar way, I, I want to say. I mean, his parents both were always into kind of extravagant oddities in, on, in, in, around the dinner table, just like, you know, growing up, I remember eating like kippers and like saltines, just like stuff that like, to me, it's normal. But like when I'm around certain social circle, circles, they're like, people are like, what the, that's just... That's bizarre. Like, that's weird. You know what I mean? So yeah. at some point, I think he kind of came into that for himself as well. Because I remember growing up when we were younger, like, my mom did most of the cooking. And then I don't know what age I would have been. But shout out to Tammy. Shout out to Tammy. Go ahead, but, uh, Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, at some point, my dad just, like, fell in love with the craft. And then it became yeah. that. I mean, like, it, it started, like you're saying, with looking at recipe books and then and kind of, like, gathering recipe, like, family recipes and, and things that people would share with them. And then he would just experiment, you know, and it's like, you know, you always start out like with like a rough template and you might make a bunch of mistakes and maybe make yeah. some, some gross dishes along the way. But he's at the point now where um, my wife, Chelsea, she's yeah. she's so funny. She always uh, she always messes with him because around like the holidays and she's a vegan. Uh, he'll always make like a vegan dish for her, like something that he just like conjures. Yes. And she's always like, I hate that you're a better vegan than me. Because yes, he always good. makes these like. <laughs> crazy dishes Good. that are just like they start yes. with a template and then he just starts messing around with like crazy additives and and just weird you know just weird phenomena and it's yes. it's, it's great so I, I love that that's how it started yes so what at what point then growing up for you did you um consider the fact that it could become a job or there was something that you'd want to go to school for well i would i would say so i really love to cook um but my initial, I would say my initial love was wanting to be in my dad's business. Mm. So my dad had, um, he had a, a stationary company. Okay. That it was called Worstel Stationery, and his dad started it. And he was passing, he was kind of taking that torch, so to speak. Yeah. And... All the while, I was learning how to cook, and um, my real dream in life, honestly, was to work for my dad. Yeah. Um, in the family business, my brother got to do it, I think, for two summers. Okay. Um, and he loved that, um, and it was around 2000 that the business sort of started to decline a little bit. Hmm. With Staples, Office Max, of course, yeah. and, you know, all those big, I'll call them Walmarts. Yeah, the culture the, was evolving really, really yes, fast. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So demand for office supplies went skyrocketed, and these small companies like my family's weren't able to make it. Yeah, they couldn't compete with the, the no, Staples. Yeah. No, and it was basically literally like Walmart coming into town and just kind of taking these mom-and-pop places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that was in Hatboro, um, and that's a small place, you know, too. So um, from that, I experienced probably my first, uh, my first level of grief that I ever experienced, mm. kind of a loss of a dream. Of the uh, office supplies, uh, working with my dad, but I knew that I had the cooking to fall back on. Yeah, I loved it. I wanted to uh, eventually become a personal chef. Um, so once that, once I went through that, my dad losing the business, I just thought, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pursue cooking. Mm. I'm gonna be a chef. You know. Um, and my dad supported that. Like, I love cooking for my dad and, you know, those, that type of loss, I use that loss in order to push me and give me momentum. Right, yeah. In cooking school. So that was my second desire in life was to become a chef. Mm -hmm. So I turned what was a hobby then into a career. So, um, did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Good. So you went to we did, we just talked about this at dinner. Did yeah. you? So you went to a school in um. Where was where do you go to school up in New York? I went to the Culinary Institute of America. Okay. Yeah, right on uh, on the Hudson River. Okay. 
and it was in uh, Hyde Park, New York, right on the edge of, say, Poughkeepsie. Right. So after uh, you had gone to school then, like, how did you jump into the workplace? Like, did you start working for a restaurant, or did you kind of just start doing your own thing? Well, I... And just, sorry, just to give people a scale, what year was this, or what time, roughly? Oh, it was, oh, 2000... 2000 to 2001, I think I I was working at the William Penn Inn. Okay. So that was kind of my first. I did like a work study program, mm-hmm. senior in high school. You know, you get to know what you want to do. I worked under a chef named Matthew Doman, who was uh, still a very close friend of mine. Part of my story uh, still to this day. I'll talk to you more about that. Mm-hmm. Um so I started working for him, and that was before I went to culinary school. And he went to the Culinary Institute of America. So after I worked with him for a little bit, he pushed me to go there. He said, I can give you a reference letter. It gives you, like, a certain amount of money off. It's like a scholarship. Right. So I applied. I didn't take the SATs. I didn't, you know... They said I might not need it going to culinary school, mm-hmm. so I was like, cool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Right on. <laughs> yeah, no, no stress. No, yeah, right. You know. So I just uh, I found my way up there after that, um, and, yeah, that's kind of how I ended up there. Okay. So when you got out then, like, did you jump in to being home chef Kenneth, or what happened after school? I, so I had gone through, I went through my internship. Which was in Cape May, New Jersey. Okay. That was a year and a half into my uh, cooking, into my cooking school. Mm-hmm. So I worked in Cape May for like eight years on and off. Okay. Or six years like on Like a summertime and, type yeah, thing? Yeah. yeah, I say eight years because it was kind of piecemeal mm-hmm. with summers and, you know, things like that. I worked for Matthew's uh, sister. Okay. So the chef from the William Penn Inn. Helped me get the place at the Washington Inn in uh, Cape May, New Jersey. Nice. So she was like, I th- I think I respond best to a female boss, honest yeah. to God. Because of the way that she was able to kind of, you know, a lot of men just want to get get the uh, get the job get done. Get it done, you yeah. Know, like, yeah. get her done, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, And uh, I think she was good for me because she saw my emotional side and she was able to, um, I don't know, some women, a lot of women have this wonderful way of seeing different perspectives on how to solve problems. And, yeah, absolutely. You know, how to, uh, basically, she was the mother in the kitchen, mm-hmm. honest to God, like... Was it something like similar? Did it remind you of your grandmother at all? You think there's some kind of similarity there? I, I was just gonna say that, yeah, yeah because um, it was sort of like she was, she like gathered everybody, mm. you know. Um, the thing I loved about the thing I love about being a chef is, you know, essentially you're taking people away from their lives, having them sit down at. at a restaurant table or your table or even in a hospital. Or a havoc. campfire. A campfire, Anywhere. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. I just cooked steaks the other night. They were like 20 ounces on a hardwood fire. Mm. You know, we burned some pallets too, but, you know, a little chemical is good for you. <laughs> so. Toughens you up, right? Like, like, absolutely. Like, yeah. Carcinogens are life. Some, That's of, those, what I some say. of those Eagles players could use them. Yes. Some of that. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was kind of my. That's what I did directly out of school. Okay. You know, and then I worked for a hotel for a while, the DoubleTree Hilton here mm-hmm. uh, near King of Prussia, and that was an amazing experience and. Uh, thank God that um, I didn't work on Sundays. So I had an offer to be the sous chef there, mm-hmm. the, like executive sous chef. Someone came and said, uh, you know, we really want you for this position. Um, I was going to church a lot at the time, and um, I didn't want to work Sundays. Mm-hmm. So they said, well, we can. We want you to have the position so bad. And this at the hotel? At right? the hotel, okay. yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. And uh, after that, 
I said to myself, you know, I've always had this dream of being a personal chef Mm -hmm. and working in people's homes. And maybe this is just what I need to get into my own business. Right, yeah. So it was like this sort of self-discovery time of... um, it was like, I don't know, I felt like it was fight or flight. Yeah. Like, either do it now, or maybe you won't do it, and you'll just work for someone else. Right. You know? So you took the jump? I did. I did. I, uh, it, it was called Ken's Heart Cookery, um, or Home Chef Kenneth is my Gmail account. Right. <laughs> and that's how, <laughs> is that how that started? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So I remember, um, what yeah. year was this, roughly? Um... A bunch of years ago. I okay. don't know. Maybe Cause I rem- seven years ago. That, that makes so? sense. Okay. Because okay. I remember when I used to host the open mic at Steel City in yeah. Phoenixville. Yes. And that's where we met, right? Yes, sir. And I didn't know, have any idea who you were yes. or anything. And I remember you handing me your business card. And I kept that. Bus- I think I still have it somewhere. I kept it in like a uh, one of those like things that hold business cards. You know what I mean? Just from work- being at yeah. the coffee shop, everyone would come through like, here's my business. Here's what I do, whatever. And it's so funny because then years later when you actually like came part of our friend circle and all yeah. that, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> we met like years ago when you were doing this and you were explaining like what you did and all that. And I remember taking your card and being like, that's pretty neat. That's, yes. That's very cool. Yeah. I, I remember that now. Yeah. Holy cow. It's so wild, man. Steel City. I just did a podcast recently with uh, the, the ex, ex-owner of what? Steel City, Eli. He's Eli, a, Eli yeah. Wanger, yeah, he's a great guy. Wow. Yeah. That's freaking awesome. That place awesome. brings people together. That's what it does. Yes. It's phenomenal. You know about that, that sort of, that's the language of the heart. Mm-hmm. You know, getting people together. Um, that's what I loved about, about all that. Like being in the kitchen or, you know, everything I do in life is, I think, revolved around what I hope, you know, people, the the way people view me is that I love to bring people together. Mm. And I love to um, make sure people feel listened to, mm. valued, um, that. When I when I see you, you know you're gonna get eye contact. And when I ask you how are you doing, um, you're present. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Did you feel like so when you started doing the home chef thing? Because I don't really know much about like um, I guess your journey because you did that for a long time. As far as like what kind of work it was, I mean, were you being hired for like parties and like that type of thing? Like, like what was what was that like, like, over the course of those years? Did you enjoy it? I mean, a full scope, I would say I've done things for people in hospice. I've done, um, I've cooked for people that are working with nutritionists that wanted to lose weight. Right. I helped them lose a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. You know, I would go in, I would empty pantries, and people would want to fight me, and, <laughs> you know. Well, that's I a mean, huge thing, thing right now. I mean, yeah. that's, like, specifically with, uh, like, UFC fighters yeah. and stuff, because, like, they have to cut weight, so it's a big thing to hire, like, a personal, not, like, a nutritionist, but a chef, like, a person yes. who actually will, like, a couple, a couple times a week, or maybe every day of the week, depending on how big you are, I guess. Like, yes. they prepare each meal, make sure everything is portion controlled, like, yes. all, like, the calories and the ingredients, like, everything is clean so yes you were ahead of your time i was ahead of my time (laughs) what am i doing in construction right now (laughs) no i'm just kidding no but i would uh i would do home parties i would do uh you know parties where i did a lot of my advertising on craigslist believe it or not that's wild man craigslist facebook social media helped my business a lot Mm -hmm. like i never i never really I did the I did the advertising every so often, mm-hmm. and then like so many small businesses, everything became word of mouth. Mm. Like I did something for this person, I did something for right, that yeah. person. Like, um, I think one of the highlights uh, that I can remember um, from I did this meal one time for a man in uh, hospice, 
And um, I I still get choked up when I tell the story, but um, he was a scallop fisherman. And I heard a little bit of his backstory. He had stage five cancer or mm. stage four cancer. Right. And um, he... He wanted me to create a meal for him, his wife, and their son. And I I was very creative as a chef. And part of my life is I love to hear stories. Like, that's what I miss most about my grandparents not being here, honestly. Mm, yeah. That southern tradition of, like, oral storytelling. Yeah, yeah. And so I asked this, I asked this man, I said... You know, tell me a little bit about yourself. He's like, I was a scallop fisherman, and you know, he had this accent. He was from Massachusetts, yeah. Or, and um, and immediately when he said that, I felt like the Lord was like pulling something out of my heart, like to get my attention. Mm-hmm. And I knew the menu. I knew the menu. I said scallops. I said that's what it's going to be, and I'm going to surprise him. Mm. And I don't even remember what the other stuff was on the plate, but I seared these scallops so damn good that they looked <laughs> like a creme brulee. That's how, like, perfectly caramelized they were. Wow. And the moment, the moment he smelled them, he started weeping. Hmm. And he he closed his eyes, and he said, I'm on the boat right now. Like... You know? That's powerful. Yeah. Hmm. Like, that to me is, that was, like, from his childhood type stuff. Yeah. He was young when he was a scallop fisherman, like, 18 years old. And child memories was one of my, like, um, desires. Like, I wanted to create, one of the original intents of my business was to get into people's hearts because... When you're, when you're a child and you have what I call comfort food, mm-hmm. it's the food maybe your mom cooked or your grandmother cooked or my grandmother cooked food for me that was comfort food. Yeah. That, and so I wanted to create for people familiar things that reminded them of something from their past. Mm. And I did a ton of dinners like that. I mean, this guy was just weeping. Before he passed away, he got something, and I was able to deliver a food item that brought him on a boat in Massachusetts in the ocean. Yeah. You know, and that was so powerful to him. And that's what, that's kind of what um, cooking did for me. Like when people say, this is the best thing I've ever had. Or the best crab cake I've ever had. Or, you know, that to me is what makes it all worth it. Yeah. In the end. I think it's fascinating because I think I agree in the sense, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I was talking to Eli Wanger, the Steel City guy, and we, a lot of the conversation kind of revolved around um, music from the Steel City aspect, but then also he works at a uh, food pantry now. So just like kind of the, it's called Martha's Choice. It's wow. in, um, yeah, it's like a local food pantry. But we, we talked a lot about just how like food as a, uh, just, you know, like a primary element to survival. I mean, it brings people together more so than really anything else. It's just driven by like the base necessity of it. It's like, you have to eat food. We all eat food. <laughs> people all around the world eat food. I mean, some of my favorite conversations um just in general have been around food like whether it's across from on, from someone on a dinner table or i mean like even um I, uh, early on this podcast this has been like a year ago i think i had this girl on kaylani who's like a reporter for usa today and she like really like special specialized in food reporting and uh, we talked a lot about just like different cultures and like the kind of like the respect of food and how it translates over time and geography like how different dishes you know kind of come from different continents and evolve and just the importance of like understanding that and like like you're saying like the story of like where food comes from and then like the stories that come from food like just the familiarity like you're saying of of the memories of childhood and how the smell and the taste like these are things that 
you know, for me personally, like I still to this day, I can think of like sometimes when I'm at work or just kind of like going through the mundanities of life, I will get a sudden craving for something that I had when I was like six years old. Like I mentioned um, before, like kippers and saltines, like that is like a very distinct memory, like going to my dad's parents' house and it'd be always before dinner. Like we go there for dinner and it'd be like a cocktail hour type of thing. There'd always be kippers and saltines on the table. And to this day, I still once in a while just out of nowhere. Like it's not I'm not thinking about yes, it. Yes. You know what I mean? Like yeah, the memory yeah, yeah, just yeah. hits me and I'm like, this is I need to eat this. I need to drive the giant and pick me up some canned kippers and like well, and do it. <laughs> well, here's the question. What is a kipper? I'm sorry, I, I don't know. It's like a um I, I don't, that's not whitefish. Let me quick Google it. Cause like I'm, oh, I'm is sure. it a sardine? It's like a sardine. Yeah. yeah. It's, in it's, the it's oil? very in the oil. Yeah, oh, it's similar. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. what the okay. I don't even know what specific fish it is. I mean, I know wow. it's it's like a sardine. Though very similar, Man. Um, but yeah, it comes in like a long can. You peel the can. Yes, like, yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. I know. I know. Okay, okay. Uh, it's cool. So good, man. But yeah, I love that, and I think that's so important. Just the the storytelling aspect of it. I and mean, I talked to my wife about this as well. Just how um, once in a while, like we get in these riffs with with just living day to day. You know, like I come home from work, she's comes home from school. We're kind of just like in the zone. Like she's doing homework. Maybe I'm working on my laptop. Maybe we throw on a TV show, and, and sometimes we get in these little, uh, like, riffs where we start to just, like, eat um, eat dinner just, like, on the couch. And, like, there's nothing wrong with it. Like, sometimes that's, like, a, a special thing, but, like, there's yeah. also something to be said about when you eat dinner around a table and, like, you're forced to look at each other. I mean, it's similar to what we're doing right now. Yes. You know, like, podcasting. I love podcasting because it's, like, an excuse to be sitting with someone uninterrupted for conversation and you really only get that today when you're out to eat usually because at home you know you're distracted by tv or your phone and even out to eat a lot of people are on their phones now but like that's just generally like one of the only times where you really have that like uninterrupted conversations and those uninterrupted uh, moments between family and friends and all that which is why it's funny like i'm sure you remember growing up like i remember getting like my first phone when i was probably 15 or 16 something oh, like that man. and like it would be like the parents or grandparents would be like no phones at the dinner table yes you know and it's just so fun. like that's just become like a normalized thing at this point but it's just funny like I, I think at the time i was like that's dumb who cares but like now as an adult and you know, see like the value and in that time even if you're miserable like even if it's like life isn't that great at the time it's just important to be present with people in a way that like it prepares you for life. Then when you look back on those memories, they're very distinct memories. Yes. Whereas like you're not distracted by like what el- whatever else is going on in the world that's on your phone. My that's so funny cuz my motto in my business was bringing families back to the dinner table. Mm, interesting. And um I had a basket that I would take to every family meal that I would cook. And I it was the foam basket. No. <laughs> and I said uh you know, while I'm here, you're going to uh, enjoy each other's company, and the internet's not going anywhere. I'm sure the teenagers hated you. Oh, they hated me, <laughs> but I was fine because I had five phones, and I hit them, and, you know. Yeah. It was so nice. Um, people now, social media has ruined society. Mm. Phones have ruined society, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, that's why I, like, I don't have, I fight, I fight technology, mm. like, with a plague. What are that, the Luddites? Yeah, you're a Luddite. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have cable. Um, I have a phone. I just got Spotify. I feel like I'm being taken over by Spotify. It's, like, so stimulating. Yeah. Um, now I'm going to get you addicted to podcasts. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I've only listened to one podcast, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, like, crazy that it's crazy. Yeah. Well, I think, cause... too, I mean, I talk, I mean, you know, I work in social media, and, like, this is obviously, it's a topic I talk about a lot, and I think you have a great point, and I, I don't know... People come at this from all sorts of angles. I mean, there's people who whose jobs are to be online in some capacity, yes. and they're immersed in the this kind of universe. So they come at it from a, obviously a very different angle than someone like you, who's more yes. detached from yes. from it. And I think that it's 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 odd to be our age, roughly, just because we kind of grew up with time before the internet and before smartphones, and then now we're like living amidst this 
transitionary period, like yes. through it. And I think you're right. I mean, I don't, I don't think, I would, I don't think that it's, it's destroying society, but I do think that it's, it's causing like a massive, um, just, just chaotic period for society because we're transitioning into like understanding how to use this technology. Like there's, yes. there's an element of addiction to it. You know, yes. there, there's an element of like mass, like media inundation. Like we're like you said with Spotify, like it's easy to get swept away yeah. with all the options and like yes. there's all these apps and, and traffic accidents. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you're just like, you just stare at your phone. You just, yeah. you, you, people walking, people driving and walking just like you're sucked into the screen. Phone anxiety. I yeah. want to call it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and there, there's just um, there's a lot of that going on, and yeah. I I like to think. I mean, I try to keep a hopeful hopeful outlook toward it. I mean, I like to think in the future we'll adjust and we'll kind of come back. Like, man, it's it's like the thing with like uh, parents with their kids. I mean, if you're a uh, if you're like a hard line fundamentalist religious um, parent, yes. then a lot of times your kids will reject that. Or yes. like if your parents are like super hippy dippy, maybe you'll like reject that and grow up more conservative and more like you want boundaries and, and structure. So it's interesting like how we kind of, it's like a pendulum, you know what I mean? Like culture is like a pendulum in a way. And I'd like to think that since we've kind of swung it so far this way, that like these next couple of generations that grow up with this technology, they're able to kind of see some of the repercussions and understand how the technology's evolved and, and hopefully come back to Mother Earth in a way and, and you know, like, get back to being present yes. and, and not being so uh, inundated by the technology. That's that's my hope. I mean, obviously, who knows? It could it could, it could be going off a cliff. You're right. You're right. <laughs> who knows? You're right. Who knows? Well, but, yeah. I remember, like, I remember as a kid, I was, like, 16, had a Nokia phone, you know, one of the bigger ones, mm-hmm. not a flip one, but... Literally, I was in my hunting stand hunting deer, and I remember, like, WW dot something coming across my screen, mm-hmm. and I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and that was the moment. I remember I was at my grandmother's hunting deer, mm-hmm. and I saw this internet on the screen, and it was news. It was like, and it was only 20 words long. Yeah. But it was enough to get my curiosity. Right. And at that point, I remember saying, this is going to be bad. <laughs> like, honestly. It like, got you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then I was, like, glued to my screen for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, man, this is, like, amazing to have the news at your fingers like that. Yeah. And then things just took off from there. Mm-hmm. I think... Um, I wrote about this recently. It was one of the big issues, too, with uh, social media and just how it kind of it's tearing at the fabric of society in certain ways where, you know, like, say, say, like, you grew up a certain way. Yeah. Like, let's let's just like let's create a scenario. So, like, let's say you grew yep. up really like conservative Christian. And let's say I grew up more like secular liberal, which, yes. you know, this is just an example. But let's um and say we grew up together and we were friends uh-huh. and you know, we'd hang out, play baseball, go hunting, whatever. Yes. Then social media comes and now I'm seeing explicit um, content from you and you're seeing explicit content from me where we're posting our opinions. Yeah. And like what we think about things. And I think. And it's and it's in a way where obviously like through a screen it's a lot different than in person. Like if you and I are in person, it's a lot easier to kind of break down the walls and, and kind of get past the the differences and work through it because like there's a human in front of you and there's. Yes. I, I was talking to a, another guy that did a podcast with recently. This guy Joe Castro and he worded it like, when you're behind the screen, there's no. I mean, I forget how he worded it exactly. He basically, said there's no consequences. Like, like if we're in the same room, we know that if you start like yelling at me or like calling me an idiot and and kind of escalating the conversation, there's the possibility for violence. Like, there's like you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, there's there's consequences. Like, you're not gonna you're not gonna walk up to a stranger and just start being rude or telling them that they're an idiot or whatever. Like, this is real life. Like, there's you, yeah. just, you can't do that. <laughs> no, but, like, but with no, the internet, no, no. you can because there's like there's you're a wall right. there. You're so right. like you know you can. You can kind of say what you want, and it's unfiltered, and I think there's that desensitized element to it, which is kind of obvious, and most people know that at this point. But I think the more subtle thing is just realizing that millions of people around the world grew up with their friends and family, and they probably all got along relatively until the internet because now there's an opportunity for us to explicitly share these opinions 
in this way where like I maybe I never knew you had certain views and yeah. you never knew I had certain views and yes. now they're wow. being put out there and like we just we don't know how to deal with it you know like I, I've seen fr- not even just friends of mine but like friends of friends and, and family members get like just tearing each other apart and then it's awkward when when there's like family reunions or Absolutely. hangouts because it's like oh oh I know that you commented on this person's post on Facebook yes. and you were kind of a dick yes and now you have to see each other and it's this awkward thing it's like do we talk about that do we not talk about that so we'll call it the elephant in the room yeah so to speak right. you know <laughs> so so i agree to an extent i just I, I i like to hope that we're learning and we're gonna culturally move past this kind of bumpy bumpy phase that's my hope at least We'll uh, we will agree to disagree. You think we're gonna go, to, go off a cliff? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Man, uh, you brought. I mean, you brought up a few things there that we can we can kind of get into. I'm interested in knowing. Uh, did yeah. you grow up? Because because we we uh, you and I together, like a lot of our friends uh, mutually and family, yeah. kind kind of come from this. Cold, I would say like a, a roughly cultural Christian background, like in this yeah. area specifically, it's kind of yes. it's a heavily religious area. But I think on top of that, there's just kind of this like cultural element, you know. So did you did you grow up religious, or what was your experience with with the uh, faith? Because you brought it up earlier. Yeah, that's great. Um, I I went to a Methodist church growing up, mm-hmm. and I. I went there kind of every weekend um, when I was home, and my mom and I would go, and it would be like, be a great time. Um, I love the pastor there. I just never had like a connection with God. Was it more, so? It was more of like that cultural thing. Just yeah, kind of like kind the, of like the ritual going. Yeah, yep. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I uh, I did that for a while, and then. <laughs> You know, going to school, you experiment, you do different things, and um, you you sort of learn more about yourself. There was always something in the back of my mind, like I wanted to know God more. Mm-hmm. Um, and it actually, it wasn't until my father passed away mm. um, that I... I I realized there was something else in the in the world. Mm. You know, so you came to it through like the kind of existential, like searching. Yeah, almost, yeah. I would say. I mean, in culinary school, my I had wanted to know more about God, asking people about Him, and yeah, you know, not just not knowing, and it never worked out that anyone was like willing to share with me, or and my father passed away um, in two thousand five. And he he had gone through a long bout of depression, and um, after it was after a few months of that, he passed away by suicide. Mm-hmm. So um, after that happened, I remember the night I found out he passed away. Um, and how old were you at this point? I was eighteen. Okay, like. Right when a right when a a, a man a boy, yeah, you're starting to make that about transition. About to turn into a man. Yep. Yep. Right when you need a father, it was like, what the fuck? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, I was 18. Um, the night I found out he passed away, my, um, my family came. Well, actually, the, the, that same day in the morning, for some reason, I, I love this artist, uh, Brad Paisley. Mm-hmm. And he, he wrote a song called Whiskey Lullaby. And it was about a guy that struggled with a woman, and um, he took his life by whiskey. Mm-hmm. And um, that, that song, for some reason, I went and bought that record and listened to it over and over again. I was like crying for no reason. Mm. Um, And then my mom and my brother came later in the evening to my place in New Jersey. I was finishing up my internship as a chef in Cape May for my culinary school. So I got home and they came and told me and instead of feeling hopeless... At that time, after I found out, there was like this, 
it was like a cloud of peace mm. that like washed over me, my mom, and my brother. They found him, passed away, and uh, then they had to come and tell me about it. Yeah. And um, so we had this peace. Like, and that was something that I recognized for the first time. It was like this peace. Most people, when they find out their loved one dies from suicide, are in a hopeless state. Right. Some yeah. even do it after they find out. Mm-hmm. It's that bad. Yeah. But my family experienced peace. And instead of like wallowing in the, the sadness, I would go fishing every night after work in New Jersey. And I remember this little cat that I had. His name was Kitty. I would come home from work and I would catch these little fish for my cat and I would give them to her. Mm-hmm. So my my mom, myself, and I were sitting on the couch after they told me. And my cat's looking in the window, looking at me like, where the hell are my fish, KR? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. where are my fish? Right. KR was my childhood name, by mm-hmm. the way. So yeah. I use that just to describe my childhood and stuff. So. Mm-hmm. Kenneth Russell, I'm named after both of my grandparents, so cool. my grandfather. So um, I see my cat there, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I didn't give him his fish. I wanted to go fishing. Yeah. So that night, we they were like, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. We get to this fishing spot, Corson's Inlet in New Jersey, one of my favorite spots. And I look up at the sky, and it was the most clear sky ever ever remembered Mm -hmm. I was looking at it through a different lens because that night I found God Mm -hmm. so prior to all this you didn't feel like you didn't feel this connection Uh, no I didn't I didn't feel that connection yeah wow and it was remarkable Mm -hmm. like that feeling um and then kind of fast forward um it was 2008 I was graduating college, um, and for graduation, I wanted to treat myself and go on a 10-week road trip Mm -hmm. from Pennsylvania down south. Nice. I just wanted to experience something. Of course, yeah. Classic. Yeah, and before (laughs) I leave, my mom's like, I prayed that you meet a woman that would bring you to the Bible. To the Bible. That's Mm -hmm. a hell of a distinct prayer. Yeah. Like, (laughs) where did she even get that from? Yeah. And so I'm heading down. I'm not looking for the Bible. I'm I'm looking for a woman on my road trip, but I'm not looking for her to have a Bible in her hand. I'm telling you that much. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, her, I go down. I go, it was like six, six weeks down the East Coast, and my aunt calls me. And she says, uh, I have this beautiful woman here that I want you to meet. And her father's a pastor. And I'm like, what? And uh, so, lo and behold, that prayer that my mom said way back, you know, I'm like, maybe this is it. And just just to give some context, this is a few years later after your dad passed, and you said yeah, you kind of like two thousand five. He passed two thousand eight. Eight. So yeah. you made, and you said you've made that connection sort of that night where you were like, okay, there's got like I don't, and you you can kind of get into this more if you yeah, want to. Yeah, you don't yeah, have yeah. to, but I'm just gonna say, t- was it like that feeling kind of like there's something more out there? Yeah. Or was yeah, that yeah, it? Yeah. Or yes, like absolutely. Okay. And was 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 it in part at all due to like because again you don't have to. Please, like, if you're not comfortable yeah, talking yeah, about this yeah. or whatever, but um, was it more like, was it also, that, did it also have to do with the fact that, like, you knew your dad had been suffering? Was there, yeah. like, a piece to it? He, or? he was in a hopeless state. Yeah. I'll just call it that. Yeah. You know, when you don't feel like living. Mm-hmm. I, I think that, I think there's a misconception about people that die from suicide. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think that. A person that actually does that wants to live in such a strong way, but they don't actually know how to. Mm. So they think that the easiest solution to handle those extremely grievous feelings is just to end their life, Mm. which is not the case. Yeah. 
you know, um, I think I heard a statistic once because I belong to a like a support group mm-hmm. that most people that do it say nothing. Mm-hmm. So don't give you any warning. Yeah, yeah. And it just kind of springs up on you. Yeah, like it overtakes them in the moment. Yeah, almost. my dad was bipolar. Yeah. Um, his brother was bipolar, also died from suicide. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like he lived past his brother. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I would say that because of my dad's hopeless state and the timing of his death and the – it was a perfect storm. Yeah. That's a, and a that's positive a, storm, though, to yeah. find God. Right, right. Hopeless, need to find hope. Prayer, everything. Right. Good equation for finding God. Yeah. And right. I think there's a, I think this has been like a, a, cult, a se- part of like a series of cultural conversations in the past several years with a lot of these like high profile celebrity suicides like yeah. Anthony Bourdain yes. from a couple of years back or it was just last year actually. Wow. It's, time's weird. But um, just this whole, uh, this whole concept of like what 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 suicide is and when what happens to people that are experiencing it and i think you're right i mean there's a lot of misconceptions and the way i've heard, i've had it described to me from other people who struggle with it and yeah. from people who like yourself who know have had loved ones who have passed from it i mean it really is the type of thing where i think culturally we think to ourselves oh wow they committed suicide how could they do that? And we try to, like, rationalize it in this way, like, like to your point, like, maybe they, they were planning it, which they weren't. Or maybe they were, like, you know, they just they just gave up one day. And I yeah. think that's a, that's a really, it's a really sad misconception because, I mean, there's so many, like, someone like Anthony Bourdain, who's pretty open about just, like, his struggle with it. And, like, yeah. some people literally go their entire lives. We're Robin Williams. It's, like, some people are going their entire lives struggling with this, and it's, like, a some for some people it's a daily battle yes just to stay alive so it's exactly. like it seems so um i don't want to say ignorant because i understand it's a really touchy subject but it's it's a, a little bit insensitive to think that a person is doing this for for a selfish means like giving up or just like wanting or not wanting to do life anymore because in a lot of cases it, it could, like with your dad being bipolar it could yeah. literally be the case where a switch just flipped and he lost the battle that day. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, had he maybe gotten past it that day, he would have made another. Like, you know what I mean? It's just. Yeah. It's one of these things where it's like you can't you can't be inside the mind of someone in that situation. No. And I don't think there's anyone in that situation who is like actively thinking to themselves, "I just need to give up on life." You know what I mean? Like they're they're deep in it. Like there there's yeah some kind of whatever you want to call it, like a demonic cloud or something that is just following them around and they're yeah. trying to reach up and gasp for air as often as they can and it's like i think i think the way you talk about it is uh is good i mean i think it's it's a healthy way of just uh just describing like what it's like on that intimate level because it is so so difficult for people to talk about and understand and yes. it's so touchy like when someone passes like that i mean it's like everyone starts to think what what happened? Like what what was going on? Did I do something? Yes. Like could could it have been different? And it's like yes. it's very difficult to process. I think that I often call it now like when I hear of other people, I say they made one bad they made a bad decision. Mm. You know? Yeah. Um my father wrote a note. Um he described he was so clear in the note that he wrote, just telling us that he loved us and that, you know, certain bills were due on this date. And, <laughs> like, seriously, like, wow, it was a moment. The letter that we got was a moment of clarity yeah, yeah. in a very unclear time. Mm. Like, and I think that um, one message that I would like to say is, you know, share your experience. You know, um, I think. It's so rare that you hear someone openly talk about it Mm. because society has turned it into like this, just like a faux pas or a, not a faux pas, but a, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Something to be ashamed of. Right. Like we should suppress it. yeah, Yeah. Like if it happens in your family. Yeah. And there's this, like, I'll just say this about suicide in general. There's like this uniqueness that is that comes up um oh i got a charlie horse uh 
<laughs> but the Stretch um, it out, dude. Yeah, yeah. This uniqueness that not only applies to suicide, but life in general. When you say that you're unique, and I, I have a tough time with that. Because what I think uniqueness is, is a person's lack of hearing a similar story that they went through. Mm -hmm. So once you learn how to share your story, that opens up curiosity in other people. Mm. And then if you hear someone else share a similar story to yours... You can then say, oh, shit, I'm not, like, I'm not that unique. I just haven't heard that same story yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah. So, um, in a way, I think uniqueness is like this kind of dark force in the in the world. Mm. Um, and I hope that, you know, e- with uniqueness, with... Um, the whole suicide thing. I think that, like my dad, he could have taken. He should have been medicated. Mm, yeah, and should have been um, under a therapist uh, guidance. Like, well, jumping back just a second yeah, there. Yeah. Did, what, did you? Did he communicate this with you at all leading up? Like with the family? Like, or was this kind of like no. he was like kind of uh, suppressing? Yeah, it? Well, I think um, he was. I think he was just like mentally not there yeah yeah and um it was just not like a lot of people will 302 someone you know get them mandated right yeah you know to be in the hospital and then that helps them along and we didn't do that for my or we did do that i think for my dad but um so it's a lot of these mental health issues are you know, the willingness of the party involved right. to seek help, accept help. Uh, with the bipolar, it was like a, um, it was highs and lows. Yeah. And when he took his medicine, he was doing great. And then he would feel good for a while and then not want to take it. Mm. So, like, with med, all I want to say is, like, if you need medication, take it. Yeah. Be under the doctor's care. Be under two doctors' care, you know? Yeah. It doesn't hurt to get more than one opinion. No, no. And there's no shame in taking medicine. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no shame in seeing a therapist. Yeah. If you have anxiety, go. Just, you know, if you don't have money, the the state will figure out a way to get you in there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, the the stigma, stigmatization has just been, I mean, it's been decades long, obviously, around mental health. And part of it, I mean, there's there's definitely a part of it that I think a lot of people feel, and I'm sure you feel similarly to the degree that, you know, it's medications, a constantly evolving thing, and that the human, and kind of to go back to kind of counter almost what you said about uniqueness and how it is a problem. And, and it's, but it's also, the, it's like, it's the problem and it's the solution. Like in this, in this specific case, it's the problem as well. Um, in the sense where people are so unique, like their brain chemistry is so unique that like, in a lot of cases, doctors have to literally just try stuff out. Like, it's like you, you go to them and say, I have bipolar or I have depression or I have anxiety. Yeah. It's literally a matter of just trying different drugs and seeing yeah. what sticks. And some people, they're lucky enough to, or not lucky enough, I should say, but they have maybe family who are on medication. And so yeah. cause sometimes it's genetic. So you can kind of look to like, oh, like, a, you know, Zoloft worked with my cousin. Like, it'll probably work with me. But yeah, I think that's been the biggest uh, hurdle for a lot of people, like in these recent years still, where people are just afraid of medication and afraid of what it does because... There's t- plenty of cases, obviously, where it helps people. I mean, I'm a case of that. Like, yeah. I, t- I took was on medication, anti anxiety, anti depressant type. Um, it was, it was a, a SSRI for about a year, and that like helped get me on my feet in a time that I needed it. And yeah, I know tons of people that have similar stories, but then I also know a lot of people who have stories where they were on medication. It just kind of like messed with their head, and it maybe made them suicidal or yeah. it made them. The you side know, effects lists on medication. Oh, Absurd. Yeah, it's absurd. So that yeah. that 
you know, you can become a guinea pig of yeah. some of the doctors. I yeah. I agree with that. Then like, it's the best. It's, I mean, right now, obviously, it's all. I guess it's, it's kind of a cliche to say it's always the best it's ever been. And it, as far as today in history, like we are the best as far yeah. as w- our technological understanding of all this. But like, it's going to keep getting better, and hopefully, you know, we just gonna keep getting closer to to figuring it out. Because yeah, with some people, I mean. I know I have a friend of mine who's uh, who's also bipolar, and he's been on and off medication his whole life. And he always says that when he's on the medication, he does feel better. Yeah. But it like it it I mean similar to an SSRI, it like numbs out the extreme emotions, so you you don't get the super highs and lows. Yeah. And then you hate that after a while because you yeah. want to get high yes, or you want to yes, get low. Yes. So then it's like maybe I'll just skip my meds for a weekend and party or it's a or delicate go out. balance. Yeah. I mean, just to. Um, yeah, it's so delicate because, I don't know, I think that that was an extreme thing that happened in my life, mm-hmm. um, but as we kind of, like, wrap up that thought about my faith, yeah. um, I think that my dad's hopeless state drove me to a relationship with something That is bigger than myself. Yeah. Whether it was, you know, for a long time it was yoga. I mean. Yeah. And that helps me connect with God. Nature helps Mm -hmm. me connect with God. In 2009, that girl that I met, I I finally met the girl. Or 2008. 2008, right. I met that girl uh, after Kate May. Mm -hmm. I was on that road trip that we were talking about. And I met the girl that my aunt told me about, um, and her father was a pastor. Yeah. So, you know, we got to get we got to uh, getting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we. Yeah. There's the southern. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were uh, we were together um, for like a year by phone, and then like another year and a half, um, kind of after that. The thing was, it was a it was a couple years that we knew each other and stuff, and. You know, through that, I I was uh, I was saved at a Baptist revival. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, that was two thousand nine. Here it is, two thousand nineteen or eighteen, whatever. And uh, I'm still going to church, and I still have a great relationship with God, and I still do yoga, and I still find God more in nature than I do in a church, mm-hmm. and you know. Those types of things. Like, I connect with God in a tree stand or looking for mushrooms or, you (laughs) know, all these things. (laughs) Hunting deer. Foraging, yeah. Yeah, like, I still have this intense relationship with nature. Hmm. You know, I hunt, but I still cry when I shoot a deer. Like, Hmm. it's those things that I think a relationship with God helps me still have an emotional um an emotional relationship with an animal that i just took its life mm. how do you describe that in the sense that you know growing up i mean you kind of grew up around did you grow up hunting or i grew up watching bill dance outdoors this yeah. old uh fishing show yeah um and, you know, Roland Martin, these were the names that I right. watched. Bill Dance, it started with this guy, like, in a boat, and then, like, the, the uh, first, com- like, the beginning of the show, they show him in a boat, and then him falling in the water, like, <laughs> you know, and, and that made fishing look fun to me, yeah. you know, and yeah. I would go down to Mississippi with my Uncle Jack, and we'd jump in his boat and go out to the islands, like, the Gulf of Mexico is, like, five feet feet for like miles right and then all of a sudden it goes into hundreds of feet yeah and it goes from mud mud black like brown color to perfectly clear Hmm. like that's the kind of things that got me involved um and my family always like they like the outdoors in mississippi Mm -hmm. and i watch those shows so at an early age, I was like 14, um, I shot my first deer. Wow. My grandmother, uh, like, she had a Lincoln Town car, and she lit up the uh, deer in front of me. 
And she's like, go ahead and shoot it. <laughs> you know? Like, like, put the headlights on? Yeah. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. So, That's so funny. I mean, uh, did you cry then? Were you, are you, you're a pretty emotional guy. I am. Yeah, I'm, dude, right. I've, I've always just, my dad was like, you killed a dog. And I'm like, no, it's a dang deer. And <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you know, yeah, I cried then. I, you know, it's, uh, when you, when you see the life leave an animal, it's like, it's something to be revered mm. in my eyes. Like, I value that. And I like that I know where my meat came from. Mm. And I know that I got to, I got to, from the moment it walked in front of me to the moment I put it on my plate, I have a certain amount of control over that piece right, of meat. Right, right. It didn't come out of a factory. I think people, I another thing I value is that People today, they are more comfortable getting their meat in a little styrofoam tray. Right. Over in Europe, from yeah. what I hear from my friends, it's like whole animals hanging. You point to what you want. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I've been, I worked with some Chinese people in their restaurant, and I was able to do, like, a Chinese New Year. Mm. And some of the animals that came to the table that we were eating were alive, right. like snails like, and shrimp. Yeah. And, you know, jumping out of the darn... Uh... <laughs> Dude, when you go to those underground Chinese markets, like in Philadelphia... Oh, my god, Unbelievable, the stuff that you see yes, in there. It's yes. like, this is like... A, it's the, the cultural difference is amazing. It's Just, beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, it's sad because, you know, I don't like that live things are just sitting around or... You know, I believe course, in ethical. Yeah. I believe in ethical uh, consumption. Yeah, or, like dispatching. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. call it dispatching of animals. You know. Yeah. I want to take its life fast, so it's not suffering. Yeah, I think it's been it's funny uh, the past several years again with social media yeah. how there's been all these uh, like a range of controversies from from trophy hunter trophy hunters to even just. Uh, like hunting in general, sometimes like a story might make the news and maybe like someone shot a a bear or a mountain lion or something like that and people get outraged over it. And it's so interesting because, I mean, I can understand that type of behavior from people like my wife who are vegan and they're animal yes. rights activists and, and they, they um, to your point, like they, they're, they're more against factory farming. You know, it's more yeah. just like the, the ethical practices of that and how it's just a complete, you know, horror show in, in these factories just um, in the meat and dairy industries. But I don't understand the reaction from people who eat meat because to your point, it's like these are people who are going to giant every, you know, week and they pick up their sliced ham and their lunch meat and yes. their sausage in this plastic packaging and yeah. they're partaking in the cycle of life yes. every week and yes. they aren't thinking about the animal that was on the other side of that or the animal that was that the meat came from and i just think it is it is wild it's just i think that's been one of the biggest obviously i mean there's other it's it's they're complicated issues but i think on the surface at least that's a great picture for me when i look at the people who get mad about the, the specifically the trophy hunting stuff. Cause I mean, I understand, <clears throat> like I said, I know it's complicated. I understand there's like elements of like endangered species and there's all, and there's all those, oh, yeah. all that going on. But even just on the surface of like certain animals being killed, it's like, but if you eat meat, I don't, I literally, I don't understand the, the outrage. I mean, the only thing that I can describe it is that disconnect from the, from the person's plate to from where the actual animal came from and i think that's yeah it's such a shame because it's like i mean i don't i don't know what the solution is i know we've got however many like what seven billion people on the planet you know it's like you gotta feed people i don't i don't know what the solution is because obviously not everybody can hunt that's not sustainable for everybody but um but it is still just a shame that people don't think about it there's like a cognitive dissonance there with like where where people's food actually came from yeah you know yeah, and I, I don't know what the answer is. Yeah. Um, I just know that I always want my reaction to taking an animal's life to be one of reverence mm. and a little sadness. Yeah. I mean, if I'm not sad, I don't know. If I'm not a little sad that I'm taking something's life, 
Maybe there's something wrong within me. Well, that's what I, th- I think. And it's maybe another layer of why people get mad about some of those trophy hunting yeah. uh, cases. Because a lot of the cases is people that like look maybe overly exuberant with a uh, with the with the picture of the dead animal, or maybe they posted something with it by being yeah. like, "I loved how I got to kill this like you know this wild like beast," and, and maybe they're just speaking about it in a way that's like they just were stoked to kill something. Rise with well, you, it's like, you know what I mean? There's... Well, even with uh, technology, let's tie it back to, like, Facebook. Mm-hmm. You know, what's what's different about having an animal that you worked really hard, you put a lot of time into hunting, and you're showing that off to other people? Mm-hmm. Like, what is different in that than showing, like, you know, there's so many... If you look at it from an elementary level, like maybe the person, maybe the picture of them and the animal isn't connected to anything. Yeah. Maybe it's connected to just the desire to have people look at you. Mm. Like say you do a selfie. You're taking the selfie, and why are you posting that online? <laughs> because you want people to maybe hey. see where you are, right. see yeah, where you you're want that eating. Attention. Yeah, yeah. There's a little element of attention. Mm-hmm. So subtract a dead animal and put in something else. Maybe it's this elementary want to be liked, yeah, or to be loved. Yeah, you know, the like button has been a thing that. I've heard some people are obsessed with how many likes they get. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't yeah. know. Maybe there's something to it. Yeah. Like, so, I I don't well, know. Well, also, I think, too, um, to what you're saying there, I think there's, like, going back to just how on social media, there is there, you're void of a lot of context. So. Yeah. It could be the case where in some of those pictures, and this is obviously, this is, I'm making this scenario up. I'm not speaking about a specific instance, yeah. but it could be the case that if someone posts, let's say someone posted a picture with a lion and they're yeah. smiling and they yes. just shot this lion and people are mad about that. And they're like, why are you smiling with that lion? It could be the case that 30 minutes or an hour before that picture was taken, they were crying. With the lion, yeah. and then afterward, they were like, "Let's get a picture with it. Ooh, I'm gonna no. share it with it." You know yeah. what I mean? So you don't. Yeah. You're right. Like you don't. You don't get the full picture yeah. on social media. So. And so many hunters that I know are these people that want to actually make the the place they hunt better. Mm. Uh, yeah, conservationists. They're yeah. upset because there's trash yep. in their hunting spot. They're upset because. They honestly feel like they're helping the environment by controlling populations. Mm. Like um, old animals. Like I, I've i shot a lot of older bucks. Yeah. Like old Well, that's the bucks. name of the game, right? You want to yeah. go after the older animals. That's what I yeah. do. I mean, yeah. some people just shoot. If it's brown, it's down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but right, right. I'm, There's always those I'm people. I'm not like yeah. that, yeah. you know? So... I mean, even um, I I look after bees, mm-hmm. or I God's entrusted me with some bees. So <laughs> yeah, you know, I my brother gave me his hives. He brought them from North Carolina. You know, there's not a lot of wild bees left in the world. Yeah, and you know, having these hives, it's a little part. It's a little way for me to help the environment. I feel like mm-hmm. you know. By helping to pollinate things, and then that helps with oxygen. Yeah. You know, someone told me that about trees, that they give oxygen away. Of course, away. yeah, So, right. you know, if I feel like if I'm helping with some bees, I mean, I got stung a lot last summer. Yeah. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we, we had, like, a few hundred pounds of honey, and um, it's kind of neat to see the bees work and— and they're a community. Right. They're yeah. just like us. The hive mind. Yeah. yeah there's yeah. like, uh, there's a bee that was my favorite. It's called the Undertaker bee. Mm-hmm. And all he does is like take dead bees out of the hive. Wow. At first I was like, man, bees are mating everywhere. And it wasn't a bee mating. It was this Undertaker bee taking the dead bees out. Wow. That's yeah. wild. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then like... Um, you know, you watch them, you can see, like, the line of bees. Yeah. 
what looks like a mile long going the same path back and forth. Mm-hmm. Like, that's amazing. That teaches me a lot about community. Yeah. Like, bees can't survive on their own. Yeah. And they, like, withsta- they uh, keep the hive to a certain temperature inside. Mm-hmm. During the summer, during the winter, it's, like, always near the same yeah. temperature. Sure. Like, in that working together, moda- like, mentality, I've gotten to see how community works in a different way. Mm, that's magical, man. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's interesting. I was thinking about this earlier today, actually. Just the... Uh the sort of broad differences in how people understand uh, conservationists on one hand and then environmentalists on another hand and how these two things, they kind of, and you know, entwine in a lot of ways. But I think, um, and I, I, I don't want to speak, I don't want to get too political into here, but I think it's interesting how, like you, you kind of were saying before, like there's a lot of, um, in these hunting communities and fishing communities, even like beekeeping, there's all these different yeah. conservation efforts that usually revolve around some kind of industry. Like there's a, there's an industry around hunting, fishing, beekeeping, like you're getting honey, you're getting meat, you're getting whatever it might be. And, um, in these efforts, I mean, like these, there's a, so many nonprofits and organizations that they rake in billions of dollars every year for for different public parks and yeah. and spaces, you know, for for, the, for these conservation efforts through like hunting tags, like the taxes on tags and, and yes. merchandise and gear and yes. and like uh, passes into certain places and all that. And I think it's interesting because I mean, they're, they're, they kind of speaks to this cultural divide just as a whole um, when you look at. Just, just as, again, just generally speaking, like the kind of left and the right politically and how on the right you have a lot more conservationists, you have a lot more hunters, fishers, people in these rural areas that kind of grew up in these environments. And that's in their minds, that's their way. Like in your, in your mind, that's your way of, um, of uh, partaking in the system, you know, like partaking yeah. in the community yes. and, and, yes. um, and keeping the, the flow going. And then, on the, and then more on the left wing, you have more people who are broadly focused on environmental issues who kind of tie in to certain conservation issues as well but like from a different angle and there's yes. a lot more like study and biology and like climate change and all that and it's just interesting how there's this cultural divide between the two where i think you know if you pull if you pull most people like most people i think care about nature and they care about the earth they just like there's just massive you know communication crisis almost going on you know where yes. like we don't know how to we don't know how to communicate across the divide you know and in, in, in just our inerrant differences you know for someone who's grew up living in a city and sees the world through a certain way and um and and you know they look at people who are in these rural areas hunting or fishing or whatever like, it's, it's hard to wrap the mind around you know like how is that doing any good you know and like sometimes you have to see the numbers and, I, and i've i've heard it debated like there's this one um <laughs> There's just one podcast actually called yeah. uh, Intelligence Squared, and they do like kind of Oxford style debates, and they they've done debates on like is conservation or is like like this sect of conservation like hunting fishing licenses and all that like is that helping or harming the environment like I don't know there's debate in all these areas like what like what's how do you measure it and like and yeah there's there's all these different takes I guess but but as a whole you know I think it's important that people try to reach across the aisle and understand, you know, where, like what, what it means to be a hunter. Like, what does it mean to you? Cause you know, like you said, there's going to yeah. be, there's going to be those people who are like, if it's brown, it's down. Like there's, there's the kind of like stereotypical hillbilly, yes. like, you know, or just not even hillbilly, but just like kind of guns blazing kid or, or, or even like older man. Who's just like, I just want to kill and eat my own food. Like the kind of yes. alpha feel. But you know, I think a lot of, from, from the people that I know personally and the people that I've heard through podcasts and other um, sources of information, I mean, like it sounds to me like, a, I don't know if it's the majority, but a lot of hunters and fishers come from more of the attitude that you're speaking of, which is more of this like holistic, you yeah, kind of like the almost like the Native American, like use all the parts of the buffalo. Like, yeah, yes. we're kind of participating in this whole cycle. Yes, you know? no hormones. Yeah, uh, right. Terroir, like that French term of the land. Mm, and, I've never heard that before. And how that affects the like the meat, and mm. you know, I personally can taste uh, um, acorns come through the deer meat. Though. Really? Yeah, definitely. That's interesting. 
and some of the, you know, if I'm in my hunting spot and I sm- certain smells kind of get reflected in the meat. Yeah, I've heard that with bears. How like hunters oh, can tell the something. difference if bears are um I I forget if it's a seasonal thing or if it's like an inland versus like a near water thing where like yeah. if bears are you could taste it if a bear had been on a diet of like salmon versus yeah. inland a diet of blueberries. Yes. How, like some bear meat is actually more blue from it. Which that's is fascinating. That's terroir. Okay. That's yeah. the principle of terroir. Yeah. I mean, um I think that I like to know where my meat comes from. I like to, you know, know what it's eating. Um, I like to know that it's healthy. Like, Mm. my thought is I feel like I can tell if a deer has been stressed out Mm. or not stressed out. Because it makes the meat thicker, rough, what we call it. Is it not rougher? The way I tell is the amount of ticks it has on it. Oh, interesting. Like... A, a place where there's not a lot of human contact and it seems like there's less ticks mm. and a tick's a parasite. So it's going to take advantage of stressed out animals. Yeah, right. And I've just noticed that like places that aren't as stressed, they have like no ticks on them, mm. but places that are stressed like near a park or they're loaded with ticks. Wow. That's fascinating. You know, so I like to, I pay attention. <laughs> Nature hunting for me is it's about 5% of the deer. That's 5% of hunting for me. Mm. Hunting for me is getting intimate with nature. Yeah. Getting off my phone, getting away from technology, seeing animals in their habitat. Like, for instance, I see bald eagles. Like, that's my spirit animal. If I was, like, I'm Native American, I believe a little bit about... Like spirit animals. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, mine's an eagle. Yeah. Any time I've had a tough time in life, there's been an eagle somewhere. Mm-hmm. My grandfather died. An eagle flew in front of my mom and I as we're leaving the hospital and landed right in front of us. Wow. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. That's, there's some connection there. Yeah. So to me, hunting is slowing down. It's learning how to notice your surroundings, like watching a fox hunt, watching multiple foxes hunting together, Mm. running in and out of these bushes because they know that a rabbit gets confused. Right. I knew I could see it. And, you know, seeing that rabbit running or watching a buck and a doe mate like right in front of me. (laughs) Like that's crazy to me. Yeah. Watching... Watching, I one time I took a uh, mother deer out. I killed a mother deer, not realizing she had a baby. Mm. And for the whole season, that baby would come under my tree and sit there without its mother. That was a, that was a time in my life when I said, I'm not going to hunt again. Like Wow. And I took a, a year off, and I just said, like, what's important to me? Yeah. You know, that was so transformative for me. And then that helped me to be more accurate. That helped me to um, then set a, a guideline for myself that I'll never shoot a deer that has a baby. Right. Because I want to give that baby a chance. Of course, yeah. Like with its mother. Yeah. Because I know how important my mother is to me. Yeah. Like, so that's where I allowed the human side of my life and my love for animals to affect a little bit of my uh, hunting. Like, it's, it's an ironic thing because I don't like killing animals, but I want to have meat that's better than the store meat. Yeah. I want to save money. Right. You know? At the bare bones, like, I like to save money by having my own meat. Right. You know, um, so that's another thing for me. Yeah. And just just wanting people to know that hunters, all hunters aren't good people and all hunters aren't bad people. Right. So there's some illegal hunting going on and there's... A lot more, I would say, legal hunters mm-hmm. that do it by the book. 
Yeah. Because they want they want the government to know what was taken each year. Mm. And then to make informed decisions on how to give tags out the next year. Right. Right. You know, so there's a lot of thought that goes behind it. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of well-meaning people out there that are trying to do really good for animals. Yeah. So it's not all, you know, just imagine um, having your plot of woods, your deer, just hanging out right behind a park behind my house. They had this beautiful plot of land, 17 deer every night Mm -hmm. I would count. Well, five houses are now going into their prime, prime land. Now I'm seeing them dead on the side of the road. Yeah. They're getting scared. Yeah. They they don't have a place to go, really. Some of them are dying. They're more stressed. Now they have to go in the park where there's a lot of people. Right. Like, you're in your house. All of a sudden, someone comes and just takes it away. Yeah, this is their house. This yeah. is their house. Yeah. Yeah. My friend and I were just talking about worms. Like... This guy asked me at the retirement home that I'm working, he said, why are there all these worms around? And I'm I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, <laughs> dude, you're just sitting in your house, rain comes, imagine your whole house getting filled up with water. <laughs> like, you're oh shit, what do we do? <laughs> you know, I'm just thinking like, you know, like, um, that's how these animals have to feel, or maybe they don't feel it. Like, yeah. But well, they feel on an instinctual level, if nothing else. Yeah, just like, like fight, yeah. Or flight. fight or flight. We know yeah. we got a f- flight, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or something, right? You know? Yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at all at all of this, man. I mean, I definitely, I think there's something to be said about yeah, like when you look at nature. I think this is something. This is something I struggle with as well. Just looking at nature and realizing, like, I don't personally want to kill animals, yeah, either. But I, I still do understand the kind of cycle that we live in there's a lot of like moral complexities involved and you know if if i were to eat and i try not to eat meat i mean i I eat meat once in a while but you know if i if i am to eat meat i'd much rather have it come from a place where i knew where it came from and just like understanding that animals have to die I mean, yeah. like, we all die. I mean, like, there's, to your point, like, taking out older deer and, like, yeah. trying to look for older animals. I yep. mean, there's something to be said about that. I mean, obviously, <laughs> nature is not a um, a confined, neat, tidy system like, like human co- culture is. I mean, or human civilization is in the sense that where we have people dying in their beds and like we have this you know kind of process for yeah. life if, if all goes to plan yes. whereas with animals i mean you break a leg or you get sick in the wilderness yeah. so you're about to get either chomped on by something else or you're gonna drown or yes. you're gonna starve to death or... nature's not a place <laughs> i mean the people that look at the killing of an animal as unethical mm-hmm. like if I'm in my stand and I'm watching a rabbit get eaten by a fox, it's the most loudest guttural la- uh, yell you've right. ever heard. Rabbits yelling when they die. Rabbits. Oof, Google yeah. it. I mean, just YouTube. Oh, it's horrible. It. It's shrieking. Yeah. Does that fox give a shit about that rabbit? Yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> like, <laughs> So for a human mind to rationalize that it's bad, I don't know how to feel about that. Yeah. Like... And I'm not in the position to tell someone they're wrong for not eating meat. Mm. It's not that I don't care, but I understand that as such a personal conviction Yeah, that I don't tell someone they're right or wrong. Mm. So is telling someone they're wrong for eating meat, is that right? I don't know. Yeah. So I just, I respect your side of the street. And you respect mine. Yeah. That's my philosophy. Well, you kind of have to have at least partially that philosophy when dealing with, like, moral complexities like that. Because no one has the—I mean, this is this is something that philosophers have been arguing about for centuries. I mean, this is a very, yeah. very deep problem. Like, I, I personally, I mean, I look at it through the lens of suffering more than death. Because, I mean, yeah. I think people— universally can relate to suffering in a way that we can't relate to death to because I mean like with death you know you have religious people and then you have non-religious people and some people <laughs> got another Charlie oh, horse man. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm good I'm you're good, good. Yeah. But, but with death it's like 
you know, if you're religious, you believe death isn't final. You believe yes. there's something after death. Yes. So then that's like a whole nother thing. Whereas if you're not, you know, you might believe death is final. And like, yes. no matter where you come at from that, or no matter what angle you come at it with, I mean, you might look at death as this bad thing, you know, or maybe it's a horrible thing. Like e- either way though, it's usually, it's not, it's not good. Yeah. Death isn't like a fun thing to no. consider, but I mean, you know, it's all, final. It's final in, in a lot of cases. I mean, or in, for most people and how they consider what yeah. death is, it's yeah. like, it's the final say. So, I mean, I think with suffering as a measuring stick, I think it's a lot more easy to uh, persuade people and to create arguments yes. with because it's like, he, like suffering isn't the real, like, it's it's not death. It's like, it's here. It's happening now. So, yeah. I mean, I would much rather, if, if, you, if I had a choice, you know, I would much rather choose a deer getting shot in the heart than I would it being like tortured in a factory farm or whatever for yes. it's like with cows or chickens or pigs it's like these are animals that are crammed into these tight living quarters and they're injected with hormones and I they, hate that idea it's horrible yeah and like and they live their whole lives in suffering they have their babies taken yes. away from them yes. some are some are uh, what do you call it like artificially inseminated like they're raped basically by a metal rod to produce milk or cheese or whatever. And it's like, there's all this, it's horrible. It's like the worst, yeah. it's it's literally a life of suffering. And then it kind of goes to this, this deep philosophical question where it's like, how do you draw the line between what is a good life versus a life not worth living? Because yeah. I mean, if, if, if I were to come to you and say, every day of my life from here, from, from my, from the time I was born till right now yeah. has been nothing but complete and nonstop suffering. Yeah. I would think that the merciful thing to do would be to kill me. Yeah. You know, cause like, I don't want to live <laughs> like it, 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 it is the case with hospice and like, and uh, what do you call it? Euthanasia. Like, yeah. this is like when people reach a certain degree of suffering, we look at it and we're like, this isn't humane anymore. We don't want, people existing or anything existing with this level of suffering. Yes. I think that's like the the ultimate measuring stick in my view is just like, how do we reduce suffering? Which is, you know, and that's, and that's the argument for most like vegans or vegetarians or animal rights activists. It's like, yeah. it's like not necessarily let's, um, at least, at least, you know, the extremes might say this, but most vegans or people in that sphere would say it's about reducing suffering. It's not about, yeah. you can't eliminate it because no. life is suffering. There's, it's going to happen. Like if you shoot a deer, it's still going to suffer a little bit, yes. but it's completely, you, you can measure that in comparison to a life long of an animal suffering in a factory. So, yeah. so I think that's, that's how I look at it. At least it's, it's obviously arbitrary. It's not, there's no like definitive line but i think it's a lot easier to make an argument and to explain it to people in a way where it's like and this is also a quick tangent this is also my case i don't i don't explicitly tell vegetarians that they're uh they're worse than vegans but like it's almost this weird thing where i almost feel like if if you had to choose one yeah you'd i'd almost say to people give up give up dairy before you give up meat because with meat you know, these animals in factory farms, they're raised. Obviously, it's a bad, terrible life of suffering, but then they're killed yeah. for their meat. Whereas yeah. the animals that are uh, bred for cheese or milk or yeah. and any dairy, they are literally just like every day tortured by being raped and like hung up. And like you look at those animals by the end of their lives, I mean, they're just drain like skeletons. Like yeah. they're, they literally drain the resources from them until they can't move or live. Yes. And then they die. Yeah. So it's like, I, I would almost think that that's a, from a moral standpoint, that's worse than the the animals that are just killed for meat or yes. whatever, you know? I mean, I mean and, you know, speaking of vegans, my, like, all my favorite, my favorite things to cook, um, you know, I really love cooking for vegan people, mm. you know? Um, I think that one thing that vegetables in their uncooked state or are some of the best Mm. like you can combine so many flavors there yeah right and it's like i can make something as good as someone that likes meat their dish in a vegetable form yeah using nuts and using uh different things like oh absolutely yeah i mean you don't need meat to survive, I mean, maybe some people do need. Yeah, meat. some. I mean, there's like certainly like uh, yeah, exceptions. Some blood types. Yeah, you know. like you need, or like you're naturally low in B12 yeah, or whatever it might yeah, be. Yeah, whatever there's that is. There's some people is. like yeah. that. Yeah. So, I mean, I love it all. Yeah. 
I I can I can honestly say, with the exception of some cheeses, there's like nothing I won't eat. Mm. I've eaten just about anything. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I agree, man. I mean, I think hey, my dad, the other night, he made a, uh, like, a vegan, whoa, how do you, it was um, not artichokes. It was, uh, ah, what am I thinking of? He made, it was, like, eggplants that were stuffed with, like, a vegan paste that he made out of, like, oh. cashews. Oh, my gosh. And some other, like, spices and whatnot. And when yeah. you eating it, I mean, it felt like I was just eating stuffed lasagna. Like, it it tasted yes. like a cheesy lasagna. There was no cheese in it. But, I mean, it was, like, yeah. the texture and the taste was phenomenal. Awesome just like, stuff. Yeah. You can get weird with it. Yeah. You just got I think I think people, that's a big one, I think, I'm, I hope, uh, over the next few years, I'm seeing a lot more in stores like the the kind of like cashew cheese and the yeah. the paste that you can get from yes. certain nuts and um, Man, stuff like, like that. It's like wake up world. There's yeah. a whole world out there. Yeah, and they're everywhere. This yeah. is like, and that's like uh, what's his, Arnold uh, Arnold Kaufman's whole thing. Yeah. Arnold's way. Of the Arnold's raw food. way. He's yeah. a, I mean, they, I mean, there's, I, I'm not a I'm not a raw food person. I tried. I did a raw food diet for like 30 days, and I didn't. I, I felt good. I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. Um, I didn't feel terribly different or whatever. Yeah. But but you definitely feel lighter. You yeah. feel. You know. It's like it's good to inject yourself with raw vegetables. Absolutely. As often as you can. I yes. Think. <laughs> Get to poop a couple times a day. Ab- absolutely. <laughs> So, yeah, so dude, I want, I want to, uh, before we get much further, I want to um, get into, like, we talked about hunting a little bit. Like, yeah. So with hunting for you, did did this intersect with your home cooking in a way? Because I know you also, like, I want to get into foraging. And, like, yeah. I know you, oh, you yeah, hunt yeah, for yeah. mushrooms and yes. all that. So, I mean, was this kind of yeah. like, was this something that you just kind of grew up doing on uh, as a separate thing? Or did you end up starting to use, like, your, your hunting and your foraging in, uh, when you started doing, like, the home chef type stuff? Well, I did have some instances where people, um, especially people that work out, mm-hmm. um, they like to eat deer meat. Yeah. So I would, you're not really allowed to sell deer meat um, because it's not USDA approved Right, yet. right, right. Yeah. But I would, you know, I would make something for them and let them sample it. <laughs> you know, wink, wink. wink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh. That was a, it's higher protein. Yeah. You know, and it's just no fat. And so, yeah, I did use some of that in there. And, um, through that hunting, um, I cooked someone that I knew, one of my customers in my hunting spot, I actually found my first mushroom. No way. Yeah. So I was hunting and I look over and I cooked with oyster mushrooms the day before. Hmm. And all of a sudden, I look on this log where I hunt, and I saw these oyster mushrooms. Wow. And I was like, this is really weird. Like, <laughs> Do I pick this? Or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, do I pick it? Do I Will eat this it? kill me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do I eat one and then <laughs> yeah, right. see? Like, <laughs> just see. Yeah, yeah, do, just will see. I die? Who yeah, knows? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do I have, like, a king or, a, you know, yeah. a royal subject that will taste my food? <laughs> no, I don't. But, yeah. But, yeah, that was my first experience with the mushrooms. Um, and then I went to I went to one of my chef friends who did a lot of foraging himself. And okay. He said the ones that I found were the best he had ever seen. Wow. So I realized that, like, hey, this is something maybe I could do. And that same year I started doing research online about the mushrooms and some of my customers were like, man, this is something we really want to eat more mm. of because of the health benefits. I right. Mean, yeah. I kept reading, reading report after report that, you know, a lot of people say eat honey locally, you get your allergens, all that stuff. Yeah. But I read stuff about mushrooms that there's more uh, protein in a mushroom, natural protein, some of those, uh, some of the uh, vitamins and minerals that you get from a mushroom are ones that are extremely valuable. Yeah, yeah. For your body, like I, um, I started eating mushrooms. I was, I got started getting allergies maybe a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Never had them before. Wow. I increased my diet of wild mushrooms, chanterelles. Uh, 
morels when someone finds them for me, my takis, mm-hmm. lion's manes, oysters, chicken of the woods, you know, these mushrooms. Yeah. And I started like hardcore trying to find these mushrooms. And I realized that I was really good at it. Yeah. Like I was finding hundreds of pounds. Like, so crazy. I could sell them to a store. Yeah. But I got addicted to it. Mm-hmm. Just finding them, like, understanding the uh, rain. And... I was going to say, can you explain the kind of oh, process behind gosh. it? gosh. So, I guess it, it was probably, man, it was actually probably six or so years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I was still going through some stuff, trying to get through my uh, dad's loss and everything. Yeah. And... I found this mushroom, and I started thinking about how you find mushrooms on dead things. And this whole thought in my head, which helped me kind of get through my dad's loss even more, Mm -hmm. was that out of death, life comes forth. Mm. Like, that was an idea that I had in my head. Yeah. And mushrooms helped me find that, like... Because you have this dead tree or this ground that has decaying matter on it. Right. And the mushroom is like this organism, this mycelium, this uh, just a crazy, crazy network of things working together to break down something. And to see that, To understand that death happened and now life is coming out of it. So the fruiting body that you see of the mushroom is their way of, you know, communicating, mating. Mm -hmm. They send spores up to each other. It's like a super complex organism. Yeah, yeah. people have no idea how intelligent it is as a plant. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. And without mushrooms, trees would just not break down. Yeah. And you just, like, what would you do with it? Mm-hmm. I mean, God had a plan. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, and then to be able to, again, with the hunting and the noticing and paying attention. And mushrooms help me learn how to pay attention, slow down. You have to sometimes look at the ground floor, the forest floor, and, like, notice where the mud is or... Some mushrooms will push tree uh, the leaves up. Mm, so you'll see like kind of like a like bump a in the steeple, leaves. Like a steeple, like a little yeah. steeple kind of thing. So you notice little idiosyncrasies of the forest floor. And how does that extend into the rest of your life? For me, it helps me notice people a little bit more. Like if I'm at a coffee shop and I... I see someone's body language is kind of down and downtrodden. Mm -hmm. Like, I notice looking for mushrooms help me notice a bigger picture. Yeah, you're looking, your intuition's kind of kicked up. Like you mentioned earlier, when we were getting dinner earlier, you you said, like, um, a a certain person, like, you were talking to recently wasn't making eye contact. Yeah. Like, in in a way where it was just... Very, it was apparent that there was either something going on or maybe yeah. something wrong or yeah. just like either. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, obviously in some cases it's more obvious, but some cases it's really subtle. Yes. And you have to pay attention. Yes. You know? so, so I attribute mushrooms, hunting, you know, my past, my family, storytelling, mm-hmm. all those things kind of help me to be better informed as a person. Yeah. And to know how to read people and i can thank mushrooms for that so funny man you know like learning how to read the land yeah um i was telling you a little bit about this the man uh just this (laughs) yes yes get into it (laughs) yeah yeah like these maitake mushrooms hen of the woods are called Mm -hmm. um I find, like, I can find hundreds, maybe a 1,000 pounds in a season. Yeah. And I've learned, like, how to identify large trees. Yeah. 
And you have spots. Yeah. Like there's yeah, spots yeah, yeah, that yeah. you have to go back yes, to. Every and, year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And these trees get this root rot that the uh, maitake is actually like a parasite. Mm-hmm. So once this tree starts to decline and get this root rot, the mushrooms will be everywhere mm-hmm. around this tree. So um, one time I'm going out, and I had taken this guy. Like I've only taken a few people mushroom hunting because, to me, it's a private thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's a relationship I have with nature. And you found these spots. It's not necessarily it like years. yeah. It's yeah. not. It's not like hunting it, where you can kind of go out into the woods and explore. Like these are very yeah. particular. These are particular. Spots. I busted yeah. my ass to find them. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry if I've never shown you. Like, don't take it right. personally. And you only like, have, And just so people know, you what is is there? I don't know if it's an exact science, but isn't it like you have two days after it rains or three days? Well, it's, what is it? Oh, that I don't know. Okay. So I'm not that much of a nerd in, okay. into the whole mushroom. Yeah. I just know what season. I look from prior years. I do have a journal, mm-hmm. a private journal. Don't ask to look at it, Nate. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to get that journal. Yeah, yeah, no, you're not. You never will. <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah, so I know about that. I know the season. I know the months mm-hmm. when they come out. Yeah. I know, like, after a rain, like, last summer, chanterelles were just everywhere. Mm. And they were perfect because perfect bouts between rain and dryness. So, like, like they just keep coming back. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. awesome. And I harvest them sustainably. I have a knife. I cut the bottom. I leave about a quarter of the mushrooms so still on the ground. Back, um, yeah, I yeah. hope so. Gosh. Yeah. I have some spots. If if I screwed them up, I'd be really sad. Mm, yeah. You know, so I try my best to leave because they spore. I use a bag that has holes in it mm-hmm. that uh, some of the spores, if possible, can get out. Right. And then kind of create new spots. Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. I, I sell some, like, not to, you know, I'll just say I sell some. Yeah. Not like. I can't tell you if I sell them to restaurants or not. Right. Like legal stuff. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. So no hallucinogenics, which yeah. is another. Way. That's a whole other thing. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like, how did you. So <laughs> it's such like a huge leap for people. I mean, the first time I heard this, it's just funny how, um, you know, like people think there's a lot of poisonous mushrooms out there oh, and you're going out in the point. woods and making like. Yeah, the, uh, a judgment call. Like you're you're reading books and you're looking at pictures and you're trying to like yeah. connect these dots. Like yes. how what is that? What was that process like for you? Whew. I realize that you don't want to. I don't personally want to harvest anything that looks like another mushroom. Hmm. It's a lookalike. It's yeah. called a lookalike. Um, I stick with oysters, hen of the woods, chicken of the woods, morels, uh, chanterelles, black. Just trumpets. stuff you're really familiar with. It's stuff that doesn't have a lookalike. Yeah. So. You find this mushroom, it's this way. It's very distinct. Very distinct. There's no lookalikes. Yeah. So I know it's safe. Hmm. So it's just a matter of, you know, when you get into mushroom hunting, you know not to, like, take a mushroom off poison oak. or Right. Because mushrooms, a lot of them... Uh, feed off of poisonous things. Mm. They're using oyster mushrooms to clean up oil spills. Wow. Because they neutralize the uh, chemicals. Hmm. They're using, That's wild. I've sold them to uh, people that, are, uh, that were in chemotherapy because it helped their stomach. Or, really? Yeah, it like, took away some of the chemicals. Mm. So that's kind of the research that has been done. I hope it's good research. You know, yeah. I, I feel like I'm helping people sometimes. I think, I mean, mushroom, I mean, just like we're talking earlier, vegetables and whole oh, foods. Yeah. I mean, oh, it, there's, mushrooms there's are something damn to good. it. Yeah, there's, <laughs> a lot of, there's a lot of good stuff to mushrooms. Yeah, amen. And they're dense. Like, dude, when you throw oh, a, yeah. like a, like with a, some of those, um, like chicken of the woods oh, or, gosh, yeah. or uh, I'm trying to think some of the other ones, like the uh, lion's mane. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say lion's oh, mane. Like when you, th- it's like a steak. Yes, when you, it is. When you throw that on a pan with some butter. Vegetarian and salt. steak, I guess. Yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> I mean, you can cook it like a steak. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's wild. I, I didn't. I, I just realized we kind of like we dovetailed a little bit. You were about to tell your story about your uh, the man oh, with your yeah, spot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> one of the best mushroom stories is I found. So I found this huge tree that I knew was going to produce some mushrooms, and 
I'm, I'm showing my friend, this guy who's about to leave for Alaska, so he's never going to go back there probably. Mm-hmm. So I felt safe. Yeah. I felt safe. One of the three people I've ever taken. And we get there, and I'm like, let's just check this tree. To be honest, I was taking the kid just to, like, walk him around, not actually show him any. Yeah. Because that's the kind of mushroom hunter I am. I, I want them all to myself, yeah, honestly. Of course. Naturally. <laughs> yeah. You're a dragon. Yeah, this is yeah. your hoard of gold. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I take him to this tree. I know it was a big-ass tree. And uh, so we get there, and literally it's the biggest cache of uh, my talkie mushrooms I'd ever found. Wow. We're talking 300 pounds, like a massive organism. Yeah. Well, I get there. I'm starting to, uh, you know, pack a few bags with them and a bus pan, like for when you see a waiter, like cleaning a table off. It was that much. Yeah. Like seven or eight bags, big bags Mm -hmm. like those. uh, I don't want to have a grocery bag bag type thing. Yeah, right, right. And this thing filled And here I hear what I thought was a deer running through the woods. And it's this old, I think he was Italian, just this old (laughs) Italian guy, which would make sense because these mushrooms, like people come from Italy and they have them over there. Mm. So they love them so much. So they protect their spots. This guy comes over and he's like yelling at me. No, no, no. You found my spot, you some bitch. And, yeah, you know, yeah. like, and apparently uh, he had been coming to this spot for 40 years. No way. Yeah, 40 years. Wow. The same tree. And so at first I started to leave and I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> let's get the seat. Yeah, we got the bag. Let's yeah, get out of yeah. here. So my fr- this guy and I are walk trying to run away basically. Mm-hmm. This guy grabs me by the legs. Nah. Yes, yes. <laughs> if you've seen a, a little kid like grabbing a leg and being drugged, that yeah. was me. I couldn't move. Yeah. So it slowed me down. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, you took my spot, this and that. And, yeah, yeah. You know, he's just trying to get me to stop to talk to me, basically. Yeah. And at that point, I stopped. I started talking to him and got his story. And, you know, then I just gave him like half of what I found. Mm-hmm. And I haven't been back there since. It's his spot. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't because he looked old and... uh you know, he. Uh, I'm hoping he dies soon. And like, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm only kidding. Pass that no, spot yeah, on. No, no, no. Hey, no, someone, no, someone's got to have it. No, but, I mean, 300 pounds. I mean, yeah. that is like see that's ethical. Wild. Um, if I ever find someone's spot, I found like three people's spots. Uh-huh. Like, if. If I find out that someone's been going there and I talk to them and. I try to create a little relationship. Right, yeah. Like, and I told the guy, I said, take half and I'll never come here again. Mm-hmm. And that's just my unwritten rule. That's great of you, man. Yeah. yeah. I haven't been back Well, you'd since. hope that someone would be as uh, gracious toward you yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or not take everything. Yeah, pay it forward. Yeah. yeah. So that was, that's what happened in my experience. And I've shown people spots, and they've taken my mushrooms. Yeah. And I've known they did it. (laughs) So that's why I've only shown a few people. Right. Because I've been burned. Yeah. I've had friends that I've shown just take my mushrooms. Yeah. And uh, it's fine. Uh, You probably know someone. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so, but it's fine. I mean... The the woods at the end of the day are free. Absolutely. And they're not mine. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I try to trespass as much as I can. Like, 
<laughs> uh, even if there's a posted sign, it's better to seek forgiveness than ask permission, in my opinion. <laughs> Just with mushrooms. Well, I mean, specifically with land, too. I mean, like, in this case. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's land. Like, I know. It, like, in most cases, I mean, I, I remember uh, my ex-girlfriend, Rachel, when, when living yeah, in green, yeah, yeah, green yeah, land. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, there's just, like, hundreds of acres of woods out there, and almost all of it is privately owned. Yes. But, like, the people that privately own it are never in those woods. Never. Almost yeah. never. I mean, yep. like, they might, yeah, you can't even hunt in green lane. It's literally just your land. Like, yes. They, they might walk around or, yep. like, yep. have, like, a tree fort, but it's yeah. just funny. I mean, like, with land itself, yeah, you, I mean, I guess I understand there's laws, but, I mean, yes. there should also be some level of, of a grace understanding yeah. between human beings, like you I know. just say I'm Native American. <laughs> that just stops you know, all like, the questions. Yeah, yeah like <laughs> hey, ha, hey, don't bother me. I'm Native American, yeah. so I had this land before you. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, yeah, that's unbelievable. You man. stole my land. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, put it back on. Yeah, them. exactly. This yeah. might have actually been my yes, ancestral exactly. land. Right, exactly. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Do you find like just just kind of getting going back to this whole idea of of uh, you kind of touched on finding God in nature and uh, nature becoming like a almost like an apparatus for for peace and and you know and and centering yourself and all of that. I mean, do you just like given the past? Let's let's just say the past you know decade plus or decade or so. Um, yeah. Of you kind of like in the aftermath of your dad passing, and I know like yeah. you have a lot of just you know like there's there's like mental health issues yeah. like in your family, and like yes. I know you've struggled to a yeah. degree with some of this. Man, is uh is do you consider like nature like an antidepressant to yourself almost in a way oh, like man. like theoretically? Yes. Yeah. I've never actually taken medicine myself. Mm. Um, I think that I don't drink alcohol, so. Or do any other drugs. Yeah. That's been... That's been huge. I'm able to, uh, you know, think on my own. And um, that's part of my toolkit. Mm. Um, being in nature is part of my toolkit. Yeah. I look at... I try to look at life personally as like a toolkit. You're right. You have things that work. You have things that serve you well. And you have things that don't serve you well. Right. You try for a while certain things, and when they don't serve you anymore, you you try to let them go mm. and be aware, like being self-aware. Yeah. I know that – so people that ride motorcycles, they say no matter what went on during my day, when I get on that bike, my head just gets clear. Right, right. So it's like I grew up boating. I would get on my boat, no matter what happened that day, get in my boat, and I ride off, and everything's forgotten. Hmm. When I get into nature, when I get into that, you know, that gut, just me and a tree or me and a search for something, mushrooms, deer, yeah. fishing. I can catch a fish like you wouldn't believe. Like, yeah. I just, I understand like my environment. I know how to catch saltwater fish. Yeah. When I get into nature, I'm going on a lot of rabbit no, trails here. But no. what's the show all about? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when I get into nature, I know that I'm gonna be okay is how I look at it. Mm -hmm. I know that I can start over, take a deep breath. I live life I try to live life one day at a time. Mm. And a lot of people have told me that I'm incapable of seeing bad in people. <laughs> like, I give people a chance. You're a very kind person. I try yeah. to be. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I try, to, I try to look at people with dignity, and I try to see the very best in people. Mm. Um, I try to, you know, I help people that are um, struggling. Sometimes I... Uh, you know, I just make time for people. Yeah. And that all comes as an out, uh, as a overflow of my relationship with God and my relationship with nature. Well, and in a way, your relationship to your own suffering. I think that gives yeah. you a strong reference point to be able to help people that might be going there. I mean, that's something I know for me personally. I wouldn't be able to communicate 
my issue, I mean, just for example, like my wife started experiencing pretty bad, really bad depression and um, a little bit anxiety, yeah. but mostly depression the past couple of years. And um, I wouldn't be able to relate to her in any capacity had I not experienced that in some way. So, I mean, I think, yeah. you know, like, I mean, throughout all like the loss and the hard times and the struggles, like those are, these are all things that we kind of, we take them in as part of our life. And obviously there's people out there who go through depression. They don't like, they don't make it out. Like there's, there's people that, yeah. you know, have, have much more. There's some people that may, it's a lifelong struggle. Yes. Like that's absolutely the case for some people, but yes, the hope is that a lot of people are able to utilize the uh, the struggle, whatever it might be for them in some way and make it a part of who they are. And like part like, you know, hopefully they can they can establish some type of, um, like you said, self-awareness or understanding to their own struggle, because I think particularly, I mean, the way I like to look at it with people, especially younger people, because when you're young, the younger you are, the more everything feels like the end of the world. I mean, like, you know, death and and addiction and even just like like the more trivial things like school, homework, and and maybe like not the best relationship with a family or whatever it might be. It all fe- it all feels like an impending doom. It's like, what am I going to do with my life? How am I going to move on? And yes, and I think um, it helps to have the perspective to be able to to look at the worst things in your life and realize that that's just part of life. And it's like yes. this weird cliche because like you, you hear it from older people who are like when the, maybe like you tell an older person like something terrible that happened to you and maybe they, they kind of like almost in a cold way they might be like that's just part of life. And you hear that yes. and you think like you, you want to think like screw them, they don't get it. <laughs> but the, but the older you get, you kind of realize like that cliche like maybe maybe that old, that specific person had some kind of like whatever like theoretically maybe they were like a a, di- a dick or whatever but like yeah theore- that cliche itself of like that's life I mean I think there is something to that because life is highs and lows oh, and you, man. You, know, you can't cut you can't cut out the lows I mean this is like every person who's ever experienced a breakup or a close death or or whatever you know what I mean like these are the things that not only define people, but like make life what it is. Like they, yeah. they help people rise to an occasion. They help people discover like the, the, the innermost pains that they've had or generational pains or yeah. maybe things that have gone wrong with their family or friends or themselves or past relationships or, you know, it's important to be intimate, I think, with suffering in a way that, that can help you move forward as a person then if you obviously look with you particularly you've you've got as a compass like not everybody has like the yeah. belief in god but i think it's, yeah. like, it's a good centering point even like even for people maybe that aren't religious to have like this general understanding that there's something greater going on and kind of like guide you forward amidst all the suffering and then you can kind of yeah. use it to project yourself a higher power yeah we yeah. can call it that yeah you know right. like something something beyond yourself that is able to that you're able to put cast your burdens on yeah you know because this is the whole thing with like a lot of recovery programs it's like a lot of the recovery programs are religious and it's a lot of it's because they emphasize that higher power like people people specifically with addiction problems i know like they you need to create something bigger than yourself because yes. when you're so trapped in your own mind and like what's going on, yeah, it's just hopeless feeling. It's like yes. I can't do it. It's like the classic I can't do it alone type of if thing. If you're selfed up, we'll yeah. call it selfed up. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like if you're, you know, and that's why I say in my life I live life a day at a time. Sometimes it's a minute at a time, a second at a time, mm. like. That's a principle to live by because um, you never know. Right. With my my experience of suicide, someone's here one minute, gone the next. Yeah. That's yeah, a trauma. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, so I've been through extreme highs, extreme lows. The last few years now have been, like, really peaceful. My mom just struggled with depression for a couple months, and she came out of that. Mm -hmm. Like, that was scary for me. Yeah. I think as I grow up and as I I live life, I realize that um, life is, like, fear management. Mm, That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. 
Because there's always that deeper fear there. Every there's fear every single day. Yeah. Of some sort. You know, whether it's your boss, whether it's your loved one, whether it's almost getting hit by a car. Yeah, or just death, which is like the ultimate. Yeah, like, yeah. wow, this was a close call. Yeah. Or at the nursing home, I walk past people's, there's like this monument table that talks about people that have passed away. Mm. You know, like that to me, every single day I pass by, I look at it. Yeah. I see if I know someone, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. But, um... But then I also have this death announcement from a guy that was my age in my bedroom that I look at every day, like as a reminder to, and I hope you edit out all the likes. I say like a lot, but <laughs> I'll do no, my best. Just... People, people I, dude, trust me, when I go through and edit my own words, I say, you know, like, yeah, oh, uh, we, we yeah, do it all yeah. the time. Okay, yeah. okay, cool, I try, cool. I'll try my best. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> but I was just going to say that um, that reminder of that young man that passed away, he was like 33, mm-hmm. that's a reminder to me to live my life to try to do my best each day. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I look at my day and I take inventory of my day. I say, I basically look at all the interactions I had for that day. And I say, was I loving to this person? Was I kind to this person? Yeah, sure. And do I need to say sorry to someone? Mm. And I try to say it very quickly. Yeah. Because unforgiveness will eat you up. Yeah. It'll eat you up. Well, that's like that classic, what's that proverb where it says, like, don't, don't I'll let the sun go down. On your anger. Right, yeah. That's yeah. a great proverb. I you mean, better believe it. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's true. There's been so many times, like like the near-death thing. There's yeah. like, or not even near-death, but I, I get anxiety where I think about death a lot. Yeah. So I'll just be, like, driving and just be like, what if I just died? Like, yeah. those, you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? I get those thoughts yeah. all the time. Oh, yeah. I hate it, but I get them all yeah. the time. And, every, be, yeah. and, and every time I get them, I, yeah. I have that thought then where it's like, as the day's going on, it's like, who... Like, what was my last interaction like with my mom yes. or with my wife? Yes. Like, like, sh- like, shit. I need to. Oh, I need yeah. to remind this person I love them, or I need to to act yeah. better toward this person next time I see them. It's like that constant. It's an anxiety. It's that fear of death, and, and I think that that's a. It's important because, like you said, you don't know. You just don't know yeah. how much time anybody has. And I, I pray. I pray a lot. Yeah. You know, I don't tell anybody who to pray to, mm-hmm. but pray. Yeah. You know, like if you have a land, if you have a plan at home that you like, pray to that. <laughs> you know, if you don't believe in God, okay, yeah, yeah. pray anyway. Mm. Just, just the act of kind of getting your thoughts out. Yes, I journal a lot. Very therapeutic. Yeah, I write a journal, mm. or I'll yell in the car, like close the damn doors and just yell as loud as you can. Mm-hmm. It feels so good. It does. People yeah. think you're crazy if they're driving <laughs> on the other side, but you know I've who done cares? That. Yeah, I've done that. Yell, yell, like just let it out. Yeah, it feels good to just like be human sometimes. Yeah, live free and easy, man. Yeah. When I when I uh, if you can just yell in the car, <laughs> you know some of the thoughts we can't control the thoughts that come into our head, right? Yeah. But we can control what we do with those thoughts mm. and what actions we take from those thoughts. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So why not why not better your life by getting rid of all the distractions in your life? For me it was alcohol. For other people it's whatever. Well, it could just be anger. It could yeah, literally just be anger. It could anger. be caffeine. It yeah. could be, <laughs> like, what are you clutching? Yeah. What do you need to let go of in your yeah. life? That's yeah. what I say. Mm-hmm. I'm, I train to be a spiritual director, like, helping people to find their, whether it's a relationship with God or Allah or whatever it is, mm-hmm. just helping them navigate in life as... We're spiritual beings in the human experience. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we have this deep-seated want to be loved and to know where we're going and 
of assurance, like fatherly and motherly assurance. A lot of people I'm finding in life don't have a good father or mother figures. Mm, Yeah. So if I at 32 can be um, a help to someone, even if they're older. Yeah. And just be that person that they can talk to. I love that opportunity. Mm. That's been huge. I mean, that's been growing up around my parents. I've, I've yeah. felt like they've just, their roles, whatever, for lack of a better word, just for me growing up was always that parental figure, not just to myself, but to people in our lives, like whether it was our churches or our communities. Like I remember being, I, I want to say I was 12 when yeah. my parents first took in like the first like homeless person, yeah. you know, like I remember they, they got this guy's name, or this one guy's name was Byron. Who was uh? He just got out of jail, and he needed somewhere to like get his get a foot in, you know. And like he lived in our basement for, I want to say like a year or so. And then like as soon as he left, we had this other guy named similar similar situation named Jose. Yeah, he lived down there. And like I just grew up with these. What like, about Jose B? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. How dare you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, it's just crazy. Like growing up with these people, just like living in my parents basement and they were just part of the family and i understood from a really young age like that parental like mentor type role that my both my parents yes. had and yes. like same with like our church i mean they were kind of like leaders in our church growing yeah. up so my mom and dad would house people that were homeless coming out of uh addiction yeah <laughs> that's, it's amazing oh my that's that's what led to my people skills yeah i, I and you too yeah i totally agree i, guarantee I totally it. agree yeah. so and i and to your point i want to i also try to pay that forward yeah. with other people that I know because I see the same thing you see where yeah. it's just there's so many. I affirm that in you like that's big. F- I yeah. see that in you. Oh ditto dude. I mean I see yeah. you too there's just there's just something I, uh, from even for, even from doing the Stakeum social media stuff dude yeah. this is something I talk about on, on this podcast a lot like there's been, I this is no exaggeration, hundreds yeah. of people, specifically kids yeah. who have reached out to that account in private just literally just asking for Guidance, like asking for, like, really? what, what should I go to college for? I, 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 yeah, I don't know what I want. I don't know what I could do for a job. Like, I feel alone. I'm depressed. My girlfriend broke up with me. My boyfriend broke up with me. I have an eating disorder. Like, yep. crazy stuff. That, do like, you I've recommend gotten... steak them for an eating disorder? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, 100% beef. Yeah. No, no, I just like, I mean, I, it's kind of like a discretionary thing because yes. it's like, I don't, sure. you know, it's, it's very intimate and like, I, I have yeah. to always reiterate to these people like I'm not a professional this is what I think you should do and kind of give yes. them resources and all that and I, tr- and I try to you know I try to be as honest as I can within the the brand because it's a very strange yeah. situation to be put in but yep. but to, just to the broader point you know there's a yeah. lot of people and there always has been but today I think especially there's a lot of people that just don't have parental figures or maybe they just feel completely disconnected from their parents yes. and they don't have uh it's a yeah it's a yale to jail problem yeah you know what it, i mean it, it like, absolutely is and, it, and it's over the all the spectrum it's you can everybody. have all the money in the world and not have family I mean, this is like and the ma- still chase a father figure yeah this is like the like, main line thing in yeah. philly like the, yep. the main line area like that is just full of of rich people and yep. dads that are working overseas and traveling, they're yep. never home. And then these kids that are growing up in these rich households are just like raised by a nanny or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. No, no, they are. I mean, yeah. I, I landscaped in the main on yeah. the main line for years, and it's just like that's exactly you see these nannies and like and people that like kind of like do housework and might be a stepmom or even a mom. Sometimes moms, but like yes. the moms, even are like so busy doing all their yep. so, total sidetrack. But like point being, it's it's terrible and fascinating how the the sort of parentless mentorless um generations you know today like like you you need people that can pay it forward in a way because it's like like for me personally like i was given I mean, i'm in a very privileged position as a person who was raised with two parents and they yeah. were they were great and it was you yes. know relatively as we grew older like middle a middle class family and like yes it's it provided me with the the framework and the the groundwork really to 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 put put uh, to 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 um to enact that same i uh, similar i should say um similar like circumstantial just uh 
essence. I don't know how to explain it. Like to, toward other people. Like I don't even know how to explain it. Like it's literally just it's it's a personal thing. Like obviously, like your your personhood is much different yeah. than my personhood. It gave you a bent towards the human experience. Yeah, basically. and like and your value system, like how you grew up with like your grandmother cooking. Like there's, yeah. there's certain things. Like yeah. each person has like maybe a different value system. Yes, but some it, people didn't have grandparents alive at all exactly exactly so yeah. whether it whether it's your teacher or yeah a lot of people i had a teacher in ninth grade that um i was not a good kid in school mm -hmm. like bad grades didn't have much to offer yeah. i felt like my brother had anxiety so i didn't i wasn't as close to my mom at the time but and i was closer to my dad um but so I acted out to try to get attention, mm -hmm. and that still comes out my personality. Like, one of my flaws is that I try to be the center of attention, mm. and it's something that I'm working on. Oh, same. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's like lifelong yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, what I was going to say is that ninth grade teacher came and took me aside, didn't do it in front of the class. She took me aside and said, Care, I want to help you. Mm. And I'm like, whoa, why? I just got kicked out of this class for telling the teacher to go fuck herself. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> that's not that's not who I truly want to be. Mm. And this is as a kid, you know. Yeah, you don't have like the cognitive tools no, to process no. any she of this. Said, yeah. She said, I want to help you. Yeah. And then she looked me in the eye like a mother and basically said, you know, I can tell I'm going to love you. Mm. And I'm like, whoa, that hit me. And then she said, you know, when you when you try to get into school and colleges and you're not able to show good grades, that's not going to be good. And I want you to be able to get into college and let me help you get on the, the right track. From that day on, I never got anything below an A. Wow, man. That's wild. I turned it up. Like literally changed the trajectory of your life. Changed the trajectory of my life. I was never, I was a little, I love to make people laugh. Mm -hmm. That was still a flaw I carried with me. <laughs> but you're a funny dude. Yeah, Not exactly. A flaw. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. But if you're in a class and you're of trying course, to be the class maker, clown, center of attention, that's yeah, not yeah, good. Yeah, but totally. All that to say, ninth through senior year, all A's. Mm. All advanced placement. Wow, man. She uh, changed my life. Well, so, I love how she took you aside, too. That's huge with she teachers. She took me aside. Yeah, because like, the, the whole like discipline and like, oh, the embarrassment man. in I front of other kids. I had a teacher in third grade, <laughs> Mrs. Salen. I hope you're out there. <laughs> you better hope you're hearing this, Mrs. Salen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, was, she was a witch. Yeah. And she ruined my... F a few years of my uh, experience. Oh, I'm sorry, man. Just by shaming me. Yeah, it's like terrible. over and yeah, over for a whole year. Mm. And uh, you know that was terrible for yeah. me. Yeah, it's literally so, it's literally traumatic. For yeah, a kid. it's traumatic. It is. Yeah. And now, um, this new teacher that came alongside in in that grade, Mrs. Ferentz, I love you. I hope you're listening too. <laughs> um, but she changed my life. That's amazing. So even if you don't have parents, like even now, part of my personality is I try to find father figures in my life. Mm. And I have friends now that are seventy that have come into my life that are my dad's age. Mm. I never knew him. Now we're close. We're going out to eat. Yeah. I ask him life stuff. You know, I have people that walk alongside of me and they're willing to help. So many people are willing to help. Who are you going to ask to help you? Yeah. I'm not just talking to you, but no, yeah, yeah. to like the greater whatever. What? Who do you want to ask? Who who have you been prompted to ask? Like, can you help me? Mm. I hope this goes out to people and they're like, dang, I've been thinking about this. Just take the leap. Ab dude, absolutely. Just I mean, take the leap. Dude, even with this podcast, I mean, there's been so many people I've reached out to to, to, to guests, like people that are much more yeah. popular, much more uh, like um, specialized than, any, than anything I do. Yeah. And I'm just like, hey. I'm a fan of your work. I'd love to talk to you or whatever. So many people just yeah. say yes. I mean, it's yes. like it, you'd be so amazed at the amount of people out there, especially with the Internet yeah. today, where you can. This is a positive part the of the Internet. Yeah, the Internet. Yeah. The, the World Wide Webs. Webs. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, oh, yeah. But 
like when you reach, you can reach out to like college professors that are a world away yeah. or like, or, or famous, like whether it's a pastor yes. or a coach. That's or, something I love about the internet. Yeah. You, just, you heard me say there, it. People. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that connection yeah. is huge. It's like you have yeah. the opportunity, like all these people's emails and social media pages are out there and it's like, yep. and of course it's not like a hundred, you're not a hundred percent going to get a response, but like oh. the, the opportunity to have that is so important. And Amen. like, to, and again, going back to what you just said, I mean, on top of that, like if you can't, let's just say you couldn't reach out to someone, maybe yeah. like they, they aren't getting back to you or whatever you're, you're having, you're striking out. Like people, I think underutilize the, the people around them because it's just really hard to meet people and to get out of your comfort zone. Like it's for some, scary. It is. Like it's for, like asking someone out on a date. Yeah. Like like people like you or I, like we're social. Like yeah. We grew up social. Yes. We, we know a lot of people, and I think a lot of people that listen like to this podcast, people I've talked to at least online, they might live in a more rural area or in yeah. an area that just like they don't know anybody. They're yeah. not connected at all. Maybe they moved there with their family or something. Yeah. And it's like that process of, of finding that person is very daunting. But yes. but it is it is possible. Like oh, like yeah. you saying that you you've uh, reached out to a lot of these older people. Yeah. That's like one of the biggest um underutilized uh, like I guess I'll just say demographics of the of the world and and specifically America is a uh, our our elderly our retired oh my God our our, ex, our vets like don't our, even like, get me started you know like the pe- people that are just like nursing they're, homes yeah like these, they're like they're houses of wisdom yeah and these people, people aren't utilizing exactly like what the hell get out there talk to your old people and you can just you can just you can just get a visitors pass yeah, just get exactly. a visitors pass and go check and if if one old dude is an asshole go to the next one yeah. <laughs> There's, there's, there's gonna be assholes. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. really, I just really think that. I mean, it's yeah. just like you know, it's working some... at a nursing home. I'll just say this: like, the work is five percent, like the uh, hunting deer. You mm-hmm. know, the work is five percent. The residents of the nursing home that I work at are magic. Hmm. They have loved me. They have listened to me. I've prayed with them. Dogs dying, loved ones dying. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've just, my, my life, whether it was my home business or my goal is just to be with people, Mm. honor people. I love construction. I love people more. I can take whatever I do next and as long as it involves other people, <laughs> I can make it a career. Yeah, right. There's no, like, I don't need to fight for a title or, mm. you know, I just I just want to be with people. Yeah. If I can be with people, I'm happy. Mm. Money will come. I know that. But it's all in the people. Yeah, I mean, it's. I was. So. I just. I think I was talking about this recently on another podcast. Um, but like a week, a couple weeks ago or yeah. so, I was I was yeah. watching some interview with this guy. I can't remember specifically. I I want to say it was Theo Vaughn, who's a comedian. I can't remember who specifically said it, but yeah. they were they were in it. There some like someone in L.A. like a big media personality, and they were talking about how the concept for podcasting, like what we're doing now. Uh, it kind of like emerged in like the LA area. Really? And yeah, yeah, like just, you know, like uh, mostly comedians starting it, like kind of like yes. as, as a way to promote their, their comedy or whatever. And then it kind of evolved from there. And it, it's existed, it pre existed in other yes. forms. So that's how it really like blossomed. But, um, the the reason this person was saying that is because in LA specifically, it's such yeah. a, a busybody city and it's so massive and there, you have to drive like from one end to the other it takes hours and like yes. people are always yes. you know like they're they're working up that the the, the industry ladders and, and trying to like step on each other and it's hard to it's hard to like find real relationships where you can sit down and have conversations and podcasts uh blew up in la because they became a way for like celebrities or comedians yes. or producers people that like didn't they weren't they were no longer having real conversations with people and it became like an excuse to be like hey 
Come over to my place. We'll set up some microphones. We'll catch up because we haven't talked on long. Yes. And we'll record it, and yep. it becomes like promotional material. Wow. So it's like it's like a double. You get you get the human interaction, which these people in LA aren't as used to getting, and then you yeah. can also utilize it for something, which is so it's so indicative of just the time that we live in, where people just aren't as you know people are so busy and they're so caught up in technology and all that that it's harder to make the time to just have normal conversations. Yeah. So it's for me. That's for me. Like you're talking about for your job like that's the number one thing i do this for it's just an excuse for me to make time for people that i think are interesting or people that i care about to like have those conversations you know what i mean it's like it's just so important yeah i just i i hope i appreciate you having me (laughs) of course man yeah yeah yeah, of course i think you're one of the most interesting people uh i know you're always as soon as as you brought like i forget the first time you did but as soon as you started bringing like pounds of mushrooms (laughs) to my parents house i was like the hell is going on yeah (laughs) (laughs) and i love that you're like friends with my parents too it's so funny i love your dad yeah you guys like go out to dinner and stuff i'm like that's it's just great it's sweet it is sweet i love it and it's important, you know, like, again, going back to, like, I love that, you know, I'm out of the house and my sis- my one sister is almost done college. The other one's out of college teaching. And it's like my parents, you know, the past couple of years experiencing kind of starting to experience like empty nests. Yes. And, uh, and, kind of, and then they like left the church that they had been part yeah, of for like 20 yes, years. And yes. like they're kind of reconfiguring out who they are. And it's great that like so many of my friends and the people that I grew up with are now their friends. Yeah. And, like I drive over there to, to do laundry or whatever. And what it's, like, the hell? And I'm like, why, <laughs> like, why, why are, are my, my friends, friends here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like what is going on? But I love it. It's, 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 it's important. It's important to have those relationships and they carried the torch. Where yeah. you left off, dude. That's exactly exactly. But it's beautiful. Yeah, it's great, man. But uh, I appreciate. I mean, do you, do you have anything else you want to say? I mean, I think that's a good. Yeah, I it's think good it's good. Yeah, brother. Yeah, I mean, we could go forever. There's there's tons we could cover. Absolutely. But. <laughs> good for now. Yeah. All right, dude. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. You're welcome, brother. Love you.